I I had huge mental health issues. Yeah. I planned my suicide at twenty. Did you? When I was at Villa. But again, it's not a, it's not an easy conversation for people. Not, no? But I was extremely fortunate because I had people around me that were able to help me with that. I can sit here today as a forty eight year old mm. having a very, very different conversation mm. to what I would have taught when I was smile. seventeen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But also mm. I had my illness when I was thirty two. So the of point course, is that yeah. Youth is wasted on the young. It but is, yeah. I didn't necessarily have the people around me then to be able to say, you're going to be all right. Today's guest on Inside the Game is a former Premier League footballer and now practising lawyer. Gareth Farrelly played for Aston Villa and Everton and Bolton in the Premier League. Has had a lot of challenges in his football career. A major health scare. And he tells us about how he's turned to law and everything that involves. It's a fascinating conversation, uh, and one I think you'll agree is uh, not to be missed. Without further ado, let's get into the podcast. Gareth, welcome. Morning. Morning. Uh, Lovely to see you in person. Uh, It is, it is. Last time we had a chat was COVID and through a scream on it, so it's it's great you've come in. uh, We're just missing a chessboard. We are, we are. That would have been interesting. (laughs) After you've just tied me a knot over VAR, we'll we'll, we'll come back to that. I'm not not fancying my chances on chess. Uh, How far back do we have to go to, uh, to find you kicking a ball about in Ireland, born in Dublin? God, these things become fascinating for me now because... I have a struggle to <laughs> recollect what I did yesterday. <laughs> someone I did an interview recently and someone was talking to me about that. God, Dublin, yeah. Mm. Many, many moons ago. So I played for a schoolboy club home farm. What was your first? What, what, like white football? Ireland's fascinating. And I know you've mm. spoke to lots of different people because football is, you know, it's kind of strange at home because Gaelic games is yeah. so, so strong. Mm. And even now it's like, it, it's incredible. So I think you hear all sort of noise around you know multi-sports and playing different sports yeah. but it was football Gaelic football hurling swimming I used to, used to take everything. part yeah took part in everything and then like a process of elimination <laughs> over a period of time I think I got beaten up a couple of times playing Gaelic football and mm. thought fo- football was a little bit easier so started to gravitate more towards that yeah. there'll be loads of boring stories today Baz no, that's and, good this is what and, we... like, and like a bad comedian I may no. go off on massive tangents this is you what can, you're here for as, as, a, as an extremely capable host you can bring me back to centre <laughs> but I was speaking to someone recently about it that kind of schoolboy teams same as here grassroots mm. but then you kind of think oh hang on I want to try and step up a little bit of a level right, and then yeah. home farm would have been you know a really really well known schoolboy yeah. team at that time mm. Ronnie Whelan played there yeah. before he came away and they produce lots of junior internationals. And then you start to think about things like that. So there's a different yeah. kind of buzzword now is pathway, isn't it? Yeah. But there's a different type of journey. So yeah. at home, there's a competition at schoolboy level, which is the leagues, which is okay. called the Kennedy Cup. So you want to play in the Kennedy Cup, right. which is a prelude to the junior international teams. Okay. And then you go through all of the trials and trying to get into the junior international teams. And then that kind of steers you towards, you know, interest from England which is different <laughs> yeah. now because of Brexit but the point was at that time that's kind of the path the becomes route. clear and then you know when you're playing at that level at that stage that there's potentially an opportunity and a chance for you to to get an opportunity to come to England so for me it was weird because we mentioned Gaelic games but I went to an all Gaelic school okay so all of my kind of subjects were carried out in Gaelic I loved I loved it so so in school <laughs> I tell you the story because it was fascinating because I would play junior internationals on a weekend or be away with internationals and you'd go back into school and they'd be like, yeah, it's great you did that, but we have a Gaelic game on Tuesday. Are you going to be able to play the Gaelic <laughs> game on Tuesday or Wednesday? They, there was a natural preference yeah. towards Gaelic sports so, and, and, I lo- and I loved it. And I think it's something, you know, incredible pride and identity around the Ga- Irish language. Mm. I'm not as proficient as I used to be now, having lived away more in my life than mm. I did at home. But yeah. Yeah, football. It became it became the standout. All the other sports kind of fell away, and then I, w- I was fortunate enough. I used to go to school on a Monday, and you'd be writing on the back of the copy book which scouts and which clubs had been watching the schoolboy games at a weekend, and who was inviting you for trials, and where you w- where you would potentially then go on trial. How would you get on on trial, and would there be an offer to follow? And it's kind of it becomes you know that that that's kind of the path. So I was very very. You know, naive, young. I would have been a young, you know, even even at sixteen, and mm. I was very, very 
close to home and family and stuff. So yeah. for me, my decision, which is weird now trying to recollect like 30 odd years ago, but like when I was looking at clubs to sign for, for me, it was never like about money. Even at that stage, it was more, is there a place? Because I'd get homesick leaving Dublin. Yeah. Is there a place that I'd be able to kind of settle? So, I mean, it's looking bad. Obviously, that's a good ground, and isn't it that gay? Like, because it you got to be tough to play that. I've seen. Yeah, it's an amazing game. I was watching me me boy play the other week, and there was a, in the mystery, and there was a game going on, just like lots of Irish voices and looking around, some tough, some tough stuff going on behind you. Think, yeah, no wonder. I that's your football as well. No, <laughs> no, no. Sense. Yeah, but it's inc- it's an incredible game. Mm. The Gaelic and hurling, yeah, and yeah. like uh, I, I, I still love it now, and still yeah. like you follow your county. It's like everybody has their preference and stuff like yeah. that. And for me, Dublin have been incredibly successful over that kind of last decade. They've been, they've been unbelievable, but. Mm. It's an amateur game. So yeah. for people who don't know it, when they see it, Sky have had coverage, you know, last yeah, few years yeah. and different things. And then people will start a conversation about Gaelic football. <laughs> but then you're having to explain to them that these people, you know, they work. They work as well. And you go, what do you mean? They're, they're not professional. They don't get paid. There's different arguments now over whether they get some expenses or stuff. But yeah. their training is like, they'll train every day. <laughs> their commitment is incredible. Yeah. And I, 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 and again, there's a, like we talk about the best things in football, you know, like community values, mm. you know, identity. Yeah. But like they they do it because they, because they love it. So, you know, there's Fantastic. there's 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 standing associated with it. But fundamentally, you're talking about a commitment that a lot of people struggle to understand. Ireland has been it's been a really really interesting kind of six seven weeks because you look at the rugby as well and you look yeah. at how well they've done and it's the same type of thing that there's an authenticity there around it mm. that like is refreshing when you look at kind of football and where we're moving with regards to that so yeah. you no know, again just interesting so honestly isn't it From yeah it as well, yeah which is which that... is massive isn't it mm. massive so yeah so football was the one for me and it kind of i wanted to play and kind of everything everything was geared and steered so towards that. that so so bohemians your first club that we no 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 bohemians much later wikipedia and linkedin we'll have to fill it in is, the gaps well, we'll have to no, fill in the gaps because... but bohemians was my was my local club i knew that and, and obviously it was because i was going to say you went back to bohemians but you didn't start yeah, there because no, i'd no, seen before no. villa yeah it, it's got you no home farm home farm, home farm was a schoolboy team i played with Leather mad links to them yeah obviously. no absolutely yeah. yeah yeah home farm everton they, mm. they became a yeah, period yeah. but um it's interesting because I used to train with Bohemians. Right. So, so people talk about modern games. So yeah, the point yeah. was, in order to try and get better, so get fitter, be stronger, right. I used to train with a, an international athlete at home. She wow. was an 800 metre runner who lived near me. So like, I used to go and train with her because I wanted to improve my fitness. So yeah. I used to run with her two or three times a week. But then in a football context, Bohemians was my local club. Right. Okay. So I obviously had an incredibly challenging time there as a manager <laughs> later yeah. on in the story. But the point was that was my that was my team. Yeah. So at like 15, 16, because I wanted to be better, I would train with the first team. Okay. So like, you know, Give you had you had manage Eamon, Greg, Morris Price, I knew all of the players. I went to the games, but I used to go and train with them on a Tuesday and Thursday. So I wow. didn't train with home farm. Okay. I trained with Bohemians because they used to train and work at a higher so level. So it wasn't totally wrong. You, no, there, no, no, there no, 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 yeah. it's a good point because yeah, it's yeah. a point sometimes you never, you know, you forget or like different things. But mm. like my, my old man used to, used to drive me to Bo's training on a Tuesday and Thursday and stand in the corner whilst I did the training. <laughs> so it was like it was mostly physical sessions. So mm. they were they were all hardened League of Ireland players. Some mm. of them were incredible and like still icons in relation to League of Ireland. And mm. you had like a scrawny lanky 15 16 year old who used to just come 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 and train with them and, and i and i loved it so, so how how did villa come about then villa was a funny one because i had probably over 20 clubs that i could have gone to right okay yeah and it sounds like yeah uh, it's like a father ted sketch but like <laughs> clubs would want to come over youth development officers would come over it's like sales it's like mm. a lot of it's bullshit which is mm. probably a word we'll use a lot today <laughs> but the point was Villa invited me for a, a trial. Right. But the youth development officer at the time was a guy called Dave Richardson. And he came over to Dublin to visit the home, meet the family. You know, the, give the, you the, the shell. The, yeah, the sketches. I mean, we're in there hoovering and cleaning up to make the house look like <laughs> it was a Sunday. You know what I mean? And that my family really liked him. So he was the he was the distinguishing point with regards to, you know, we'll look after your son. Yeah. He's got a great opportunity. We believe he's going to be a talented player. And they bought into him. Then I came over, I went on trial and he was there, got offered a pro contract. I didn't do an apprenticeship or a YTS. I was one of the first kids at Villa to get offered a pro contract and people bought into him. But it's like, you know, when you go on trial somewhere, it's like 
they polish everything. Yeah. Everything's clean. You know what I mean? They Lush present leg. present the club in a particular way. But mm. it was a place where I thought I can I could settle here. Like I can live here. In moving away from home, I can be okay here. I the do. irony with Dave Richardson <laughs> though was, but sorry, is you know he what? left within a month of me being there. Did so, he? Oh. Yeah, so he was he was he was immaculate, and I still speak to him today. But mm. the point was, he was headhunted then to set up the youth program in the Premier League. So it was ninety two. Okay. Yeah. So he he left, and then obviously right. the people that came in weren't as weren't as good as no. he was. So it was never uh, never as it should have been. Right. Yeah. Which is obviously huge, especially just moving over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Home, the, because homesickness was massive. So yeah. Well, I, I, that was gonna be. I mean, I mean, you're 16 years of age. You go to Aston Villa. That's that is huge. I mean, I, especially obviously talking about your dad taking you to training, family a big thing. How do you cope with that then, going from Villa to Birmingham? Yeah, could not, you understand them? No, that? not very, not very well. <laughs> but Birmingham was amazing. Mm. I had like, Big time. yeah, you always say to people, always will have that initial reaction to Birmingham. But I, I had an unbelievable. No, time Birmingham's there. all right. But no, that's no, no, what no, I'm no. record. No, 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 yeah, 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 not to qualify it. But I'm saying it <laughs> yeah. was uh, there was a huge Irish community in Birmingham. But Birmingham, Birmingham was awesome. So yeah. I, I, I really so, enjoyed it. But the homesickness became a massive issue because. You come across to play football and then you have a bounce. So again, when you look at mm. players, you have a bounce because it's all new yeah. and it's like everything you wanted and it's like you're fulfilling your dream. But then I got injured after a, like six to eight weeks there. I was playing in the reserves. I was being earmarked for the first team at 17. Big Ron was with me speaking yeah. and talking me up all the time. Everyone was really, really pleased. But then, then I got injured and all of a sudden I went from, you know, been in the spotlight and everything's new to not being able to play. And anyone will tell you, even people you have here, if you're, if you're not able to play and train, then you're not really fulfilling what you're supposed to be doing and yeah. you don't feel like a footballer. So it brought that brought massive challenges for me. And the problem was I was getting scans. There was nothing showing up on the scans oh. and it became a massive battle because Villa were turning around and saying, well, we've signed you as a pro. There's nothing wrong with you. You're not playing. You just want to go home. There's all sorts of issues. So I, mm. 17, I, I came home my first Christmas and I, I packed my bags. I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm done. Wow. Got home. Obviously a chance to like take a breath. Mm. Family are like coaxing, cajoling and saying, you need to go back, you need to go back. Yeah. But when I went back, I hardly played for the rest of that season. What was... What no, was... no, no. So it, become, it became really, really interesting because the point was I was growing. Oh, okay. Right? So I came back for the following pre-season. Mm. And I was I was back fit. I was running. I was doing really really well, and then I broke down again. So I went to see. I was again. I went to see a specialist in Oswestry, right? Mm. And basically, had fresh scans. The physio drove me to Oswestry, and in the meeting with him, not as formal as this, you know what I mean, <laughs> or a different environment. But he basically turned around and said, "Well, I've got some good news and some bad news for you." And he said, "Well, the good news is in life you're going to be okay." But he said, given your back, you're not going to play professional football. He says, your back's not going to be able to deal with it. So the physio was like, obviously, oh my God, you know, took this in. And we drove back from Oswestry and he was phoning back to the youth manager to say, we've had some bad news, different stuff. But for me, it was kind of like there was a freedom around it because okay. for 18 months I'd been questioned you know, nothing on scans. Yeah. There's no is issues. Is that what it was? It's all in your head. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the long story short is, Baz, I had the lower body of a young man, but my upper body was not as developed. Yeah. So it was like growing. Yeah. So the muscles hadn't caught up. And all of a sudden, there was a recognition from the club that I wasn't, you, you know, blagging. abusing the position mm. or blagging it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which for me was amazing. So the pressure was off. And with the pressure being off, I was able to do rehab. I was able to relax, and then I, I grew, and my body, my body kind of let, re rectified itself. So let, I, let me just stop you just for a sec, because obviously you're on that card journey. You've just had that information from someone telling you that you're not going to be able to play football when you're a footballer. You're seventeen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, two things. One. How I know you're saying the pressure was off, but no, no but when you have people, and it, it, it'll probably be a recurring theme in what we speak about, but if you have people telling you there's nothing wrong with you and mm. it's all in your head and you just want to be back in Dublin, you don't give a shit about football. Yeah, there's other kids over here would give their right arm yeah. to have a pro contract at Aston Villa, yeah, and you are not bothered, right? When you know that's not the case and it creates an incredible pressure because even with family, yeah, and even with 
people around you because they're naturally going to go, well, the scans are clear. So what's... What's, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, it's all in your head. You're more bothered about other things than you are about football. And then somebody turns around in a... In, in a it's probably, you could say, a warped way of saying, mm. oh, yeah, there is something there. Yeah. Then there's there was a degree of release in that because all of a sudden it's not you taking the piss. Yeah. It's in your head and you're not... You know what I mean? You're not focused on football. All I wanted to do was play football, but I wasn't yeah. able to do it. But they didn't, they didn't believe that. So, so that was the first part of that. And then, so like you say, what happens with the second part then? Because I'm assuming if I'm, I'm just trying to put myself in the mind of a physio or the club with again. Yeah, I with, don't with know what either. They perceived as an asset. So they, they're looking at you, and we just had news from a professional mm, mm. that Garrett's done. Yeah, Garrett, Garrett's finished. So, well, not finished, but. Was an issue. No, nearly finished. Nearly yeah, finished. Yeah, 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 yeah. So how how does it become about then that a hey, you're relaxed now and think like I'm yeah. gonna do the rehab? Someone at the club must have gone. Well, hang on, are we taking this specialist word for it, or are we gonna see what how we develop? Was there a conversation? I think probably with the second bit. Yeah. Probably the second bit yeah. where they go well, like let's see how it settles down now. Let's okay. see how yeah. let's see let's see how he gets on. Because that's I a still three year contract. Bit, yeah. yeah, massively so. Mm. And there's so many. You know, we talk about football now. You talk about 0.001% actually making it. Yeah. That at that time, for me, it was just more a sense of, I told you. I told you there was something yeah, there. Of course, you didn't yeah. want to listen to me. Mm. So at and least you know in that way. Your best, yeah. yeah, yeah. But listen, at 17, you don't. You're still learning. Probably no, but do. you know if there's we an do issue, now. Don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course. And that was all, like, it was, it was, it was a massive thing. And there was a massive pressure around it. So... Whilst you're right from a club point of view, they were probably thinking, I don't know what's going to happen here with him. Mm. But for me, it was more, I told you there was something. Yeah, there. yeah, and yeah. And now you had, now we can deal you with had it, yeah. confirmation from somebody who was able to say, yeah, there's something there. Yeah. And he, he's not going to play football at a top level, but he's going to be okay. So at least you kind of shift your focus to like, well, I, I don't believe that's the case, but yeah. everything I told you for the last 15 months is, course, is yeah. true. Because for you... Again, just going back to it, you've you've left home. You you this lad who's worked and trained and and yeah done brilliant. Yeah, but there was more muscles on the top of this table. <laughs> yeah. Like that's what I'm saying. It's it's part it's part of growing, and you see it a lot with like young players now. And like there's a recognition because you can be, you know what I mean. Yeah, well, I remember phases. I remember Stephen Gerrard, Liverpool. Yeah. I remember this. He had loads of issues because he, he grew really quickly. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah, small. Yeah. And, yeah. and Jamie Carragher tell me on one of these that he was small and then all of a sudden he, he mm. was six foot yeah. and he was injured all yeah, the time. You end up like Bambi. That's with and regards that's the to thing, the point that you've no strength, you've no yeah. power, you lose different things you've had because it takes yeah. a while for your muscles, tendons, and ligaments to catch up. So like that was in theory the situation but with for me. you, for you, because like I'm saying, you've moved. You're a bit homesick. You've got this injury. The thing that is occupying you every day. You can't do, you know, you being. I'm just looking at myself. I was home, I would have been homesick like you. Yeah. And you're thinking, well, I get up every day and I go to work. Yeah, so you've got some football. form of distraction. Yeah, yeah. But I can't, I can't go to work because yeah. I'm injured. Yeah. But and no I, one's believing me. So yeah, how much? No, what, no, no. What kind a, of toll did that take on you? Massive though? toll. Yeah. Because again, the intensity of our digs was with the physio anyway. So we'd be travelling in with him in the morning. Okay, yeah. We'd be around him all day and then we'd be back into digs in the evening. So it, it wasn't a healthy environment for him no. or us. No, of course. But again, it was that that was just how it was. Yeah. So yeah. always people will always talk about football like the boxer analogy. Like the point is that if you train and train and train for a fight, but then the fight never comes. Yeah. And football, there's the external pressures as well, is that you've of come course, away, yeah. you know, you're you've been signed as a pro, which mm. brings a different level of pressure again. It's quite interesting now there's just there's been a WhatsApp group set up recently with the kind of the villa players who I would have played with in the youth team around that time, okay. former Villa players, and you're kind of thinking back that they were YTs, mm. most of them. And like I signed as a pro, so I may as well have just put a target on my back anyway. So people so just like wanted you. to nail you because yeah. who's this lad coming across? He's got a pro contract. Who does he think he is? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, in kind of nine to 12 weeks of being there, you're injured and you're just in the physio room every day. So you, you, yeah, you have yeah. no purpose and it, it, it brings a different kind of mental pressure. But mm. then you were seeing people in the gym who had long-term injuries that were, you know, struggling as well. So yeah. it just, there's a different kind of camaraderie about that because mm. people always speak about injuries, the worst part, worst part of the game mm. because you're having to watch, but you're also not able to, to, to partake yourself. So you're doing rehab, you're doing mm. different programs, you're following stuff, but it's not, it's not the same and it never kind of fills that kind of void. So it's it, it was different and it was and it was really hard and also then that external point I make which is like people outside the football family different things you are like 
they don't understand they don't understand it so they don't under, understand kind of the the challenge of one being away but then secondly the bit around not being able to to, to play football and that's where people may struggle then because that's when other temptations come Gone in which say. is you try and you try and fill that well that's so. we're seeing obviously and rightly so now a lot of footballers talking about mental health struggles I've seen Dominic Calvert-Lewin at Everton talking about Dean just couldn't get over his injury and went to a dark place I think again another former Everton player Sheffield United now Tom Davis saying he feels really, like like this was the other week feels really low at the moment injury and things like that God, we There's can go. To be honest, you though, to you yeah, that, but Baz, we can go with the conversation today. We can go wherever you want, but you mm. see, people have a false perception mm. of that you're earning huge money. You're, mm. you're, you're. But earning, you were No, 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 no. At that time, it's different. But I'm saying in relation to the guys now, is yeah. that football brings unbelievable challenges. Mm. Everybody sees the headlines and everybody sees the glory. Yeah. But the fundamental reality is, it's not. It's, it's never as straightforward as that. And mm. by earning a certain amount of money, doesn't bridge no. the challenges that people face Cause you're still irrespective fo- football are you still you want to play yeah, football yeah yeah but like it becomes oh. so like we talked today I'm sat here grey hair you know what I mean moved on to a different oh, phase got, full, not full grey not yeah, white no, not yet no no no, no. <laughs> but I'm saying like yeah. that it brings different challenges we mm. talk about athlete transition even when you're playing mm. there's an incredible pressure yeah so that manifests itself in different ways so it takes a lot of bravery to turn around and say to somebody, I'm finding it really, really hard. But yeah. you know the way football works. There's, there isn't really any, you but know, what time I'm, given to that. What it, I'm it moves to, quite quickly. Sorry for button no, no, no. What I'm trying to say is at that time, now it's more visible. I don't, yeah, visible. Mm-hmm. And maybe people feel, yeah, yeah, yeah. hopefully, we're raising footballers and, and human beings to I be think, able yeah. to go. Human beings is the first yeah, part. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Of like, I'm, I feel I'm, I've, I've had anxiety, I don't mind saying it. I've had moments where. For some reason, it just don't feel good. I don't know what it is, and I can't really tell people because you, you're a man or whatever, and it shouldn't be like that. So for footballers with all of these, it's great that they're able to share. Yeah. But at that time, going back to that time, at, at, at that era, yeah. You know, we've got big Ron from Old as yeah. the manager, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. all men and all yeah. that. You're 17, away from home, injured. Are these lads who are my peers looking at me, and they probably were thinking. Why is he a pro when I'm a white tee or I'm better than him? He's not even playing, whatever, whatever, whatever. How did you cope with that? Uh, with difficulty. Yeah. And again, it becomes interesting because like you say, that's the, that's the start of a, what was a very, very challenging time for me at Villa because okay. obviously Dave Richardson left and then a different coaching team came in. Yeah, and you know, there's been issues around that with regards to like bullying investigations yeah. that took over 20 years to sort out, right? <laughs> but the point is that you talk about mental health issues, everybody follows their own journey and everybody yeah. follows their own path mm. and the point is that even out of everything we talk about today like i i had huge mental health issues yeah I planned my suicide at 20 did you when i was at villa but again it's not a, it's not an easy conversation for people not, no. but i was extremely fortunate because i had people around me that were able to help me with that i can sit here today as a 48 year old mm. having a very very different conversation mm. to what i would have thought with a lovely when I was smile 17 <laughs> yeah 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 but also mm. I had my illness when I was 32. So the of point course, is that yeah. youth is wasted on the young. It but is, yeah. I didn't necessarily have the people around me then to be able to say, you're going to be all right. Mm. You're going to be okay. That, that's my point. So yeah, this is, only, that it's this, is only, now, but... this is only now. Yeah. So like you say, I didn't have my mobile phone with contact base if I'm going to speak course, to my yeah. sports psychologist this afternoon, yeah. you know, to be able to discuss what's happened today. Yeah. It, was, it, it, it was all part of learning that now you can say play the part in helping you get to where you are now mm. but the point is at that time when you're in the eye of the storm you don't really see that so that was kind of a first taste of that because there was a huge pressure on me young irish kid massive expectations yeah and then all of a sudden you're injured mm. you team go you team coach is gone we paid money for you you're not playing you know you're no use to me yeah. you know what i mean physios they're assessing scans you're going to see specialists and they're all saying there's nothing there's nothing on the scans so <sighs> There's a different type of pressure. Mm. So there was a release in some ways yeah. because when that specialist turned around and said, there is something there, I wasn't thinking immediately, I'm not going to play football ever again. Yeah. I end up thinking, I told you. I told you, Sean. So that yeah. was the first. So in its simplest form, mm. the first part was, I told you. Yeah. I told you there was something there. Yeah. So that was like that. Yeah, release. of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, you see, you hear it, don't you, with people with 
if people have got illnesses and they get a diagnosis, they're like, I, I told, I've been telling you, I haven't been making this yeah, thing yeah, yeah, up yeah, and yeah. Yeah. that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, so there was probably a play. similar similar thing to that. Mm. And then there was a freedom from that because then you could start to, you know, get better yeah. and grow. Yeah. Like something as simple as that. And mm. then you start to get stronger. And then like mm. invariably I did get better. You know what I mean? And then I ended up making my debut and playing, playing for Aston Villa. Mm. So it's like, there's a positive in that, but it's sometimes again, there's there's a backstory to it that you never really delve into. But that's the beauty of this this conversation yeah, yeah. is that I, yeah, it's I can look at all your appearances and I can we can talk about the goal that made no, me whatever. very yeah, happy. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but whatever you want. But do. I think the, the, but it's I sometimes think... the, the human background piece is interesting because that's well, more interesting. It's, it's what me. people, in many cases, people don't want don't want to talk about is the is the, is the dark stuff and the challenging well, stuff and football for me. Mm. Like I can look back on my career now. You know what I mean in a second career, but like mine, mine was a career of underachievement. I didn't mm. fulfil my potential. Mm. I did it at different times, but you know, I, I don't look back upon that any differently now. You know what I mean? Mm. I, I don't carry a huge level of regret, but yeah. sometimes there's a lot of people like I hear you hear about mental health, or you hear about different yeah. challenges, and it's it's unique to everybody. But fundamentally, everybody faces different challenges at different times and it, do, it doesn't stop does it it doesn't it doesn't no. stop so no. people say now like the worry I'm changes a lot, I'm a, yeah yeah the worry changes and mm. uh, fo football is no different in regard to that but sometimes when you're younger you're not equipped with the tools maturity mm. or understanding of how to deal with these things and that's why the people around you are incredibly important but there has to be a value to that yeah do you know what i mean lived experience but, is one thing it's easier to relate yeah but it, it, it's imperative that you have the right person and sometimes the right person might be there but you don't you don't see them mm. because when you're living it it's your it's, it's, it's your experience yeah 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 something. absolutely so it's so it's like it's really interesting to me because with football now i always feel that if you're beholden to football it's going to kick your ass fundamentally because mm. it's a, it's a different world mm. so you can kind of dip in or dip out but you know like you talk about anxiety or different things you've seen yourself mm. invariably then you can recognize them things in others mm. so you get an opportunity like this say for me but mm. sometimes you get an opportunity to say to people like you know what i mean yeah are you okay yeah yeah i was a social worker for 12 years so i've seen yeah 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 but that didn't stop yeah me. And, and i'll be honest when i when i began that and i first worked with people with depression i used to go into the house and go come on open the windows get up you know you've got to get yourself there a few years later when i got something i was like wow yeah it's opened my eyes i understand but who takes care I of the understand. carer no, I listen. I've again a great family and and all that, but it's the the biggest thing. And this this was what was really interesting to me when you were saying that. And, and I was I was just listening to your thing. Yeah, I remember sitting. This isn't about me, but I'll just quickly say this. And we move back to you. No, but, no, no. I'm I'm I'm, I'm all right. Not yeah. talking about me. Uh, no, I I sat there next to my missus watching telly for a year. I couldn't remember. Couldn't tell you what we watched. Mm. The conversations we had. She never knew. And I never got to it because I'm going to come on to what you just said because that has kind of shook me a bit. I never thought about ending my life, but I didn't know how to get out of where I was. I didn't know how to, to get out of that. I didn't know who to speak to about it because I didn't want to. You don't want to admit mm. it. So I'm, I'm looking at you with those pressures. You've just said something that you plan to end your life at 20. Yeah, because I, I didn't. So how, where, how? No, no, no. Listen, I I don't even say it flippantly, but I'm just saying no, is no. that what? I was, you know, there was a, there was there was a different pressure. There was a challenging period at Aston Villa. I didn't really have anyone to speak to about it. Okay, people didn't, you know, didn't understand it because to the outside world, you're living the vida loca. You're, you know, exactly, yeah. young professional footballer. You're breaking into the first team. You're playing mm. for your country, but the reality was that. That Is this how while you've done me. this? You played in the first team and you played yeah, for your yeah, country. Still, yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, st it, it, it was still around that time. But I was, I was having an incredibly challenging time at the club, and people would have been saying, "Well, you're not where you should be. You're not where you should be. Mm. You were never so even being in the Ireland squad, you weren't playing in the first team. So your mind would have always been, "Well, I, I don't deserve to be here because everybody else is playing." You find it incredibly challenging. So the point is, you get to a position where you want the you want the noise to stop, mm. you want the voices to stop. So mm. like. People will always talk about their football careers, but I don't associate a lot of good memories with my football career. So I achieve okay. big things and we can talk mm. about goals and you can talk mm. about memories. Absolutely. But fundamentally, mm. I don't attach huge positivity around that. Right. But it took me to get to 32 to understand that 
being a perfectionist is, is that, okay. It took yeah. me to get to 32 when I got ill to understand that everybody has a voice in their head. Yeah, it took older. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it took me, after I was recovering from my illness, a friend of mine uh, gave me a book, which was Eckhart Tolle, which was The Power of Now. Yeah. And I read the book and for read the it. first time in my life, everything started to make sense. Mm. So that was life-changing with regards to a period of my life, if you like, from 16 to 32, where I thought, wow, this is crazy. I didn't drink. I didn't go out much. But yet I was exhausted all the time. Yeah. I looked after myself like physically. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the point was that I was going on a football pitch and people were thinking, wow, look at him playing in the Premier League. But like trying to figure out why I was exhausted all the time. I didn't understand mental health. Mm. I didn't understand the toll it took. I didn't understand the voice in my head that never stopped. I thought I was unique. Mm. And then youth is wasted Sadly, on the young, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But in a yeah. good way. Yeah, yeah, Because absolutely. then you kind of think, but then you can look back retrospectively and think, oh, I wish I knew then what I know now or... I'd have a different conversation with a younger version of myself. Yeah. But the point is that that's all part of part of that journey. So Aston Villa at that time was challenging, but yeah, I did, still did all of the things that people would have said is classified as success. You know what I mean? I was a youth product from Aston Villa. You know, won trophies, broke through, played in the first team, captained my country, got into the national team. And then, you know, the next phase of that journey was to come and play for the team I'd supported as a boy. So, to all intensive purposes, people will mm. have been saying he's doing all right, isn't he? Mm. But it wasn't. It wasn't how it was. There was. There was. There was a lot of bullying at Aston Villa, which I found incredibly challenging. My Personal dad, bullying, yeah, to yeah, you. yeah, 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 yeah. Which is like documented, been been in the press. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. the point was, again, it was something else that took your energy. So y your your fight or flight as an individual was Switched fight on, and yeah. don't let people see you bleeding. But it took more of your energy again. So you were trying to figure out if you're. If you're constantly in fight or flight, as we know it now, and it's talked about a lot, then you are exhausted all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I lost but, but you don't know it though, Baz. You don't know what it is. No, but, but, well, listen, I, I, my cousin took his own life at 32. And <laughs> what's it on again? again? But he told his mum he was moving home on a Wednesday. It's, it's, took his life on a Tuesday and it was planned. It's... I'm not going to go into details, but it was planned. Yeah. But he, he spoke to his mum, said, yeah, I'll be home Wednesday, move back in. And, and no one knew. And everyone mm. after that will say, why didn't he just speak to someone? But there was so yeah. many people at his funeral. Why didn't he just say a word? Yeah. You don't do it in that. You, you, you're you there in this big environment, Aston Villa, one of the great football clubs of this country. You, you Like you said, this boy, Irish boy, done well, come over. He's flying. He's in the national team. He's playing in this club, and everyone on the outside, oh God, I'm fatly up and coming. And for you, you're living. It will have been a nightmare if you're getting bullied. Yeah, a different in type. Anything. Yeah, a different, no, is, a different type of life because again, yeah. you, you very rarely show people of where course. you're where you're at, and mm. that, and that comes back to like, you know, been been a male, but also you you, you don't you don't recognise these things. So again, mm. I, I'm not trying to. Can, we can speak openly. You know what I mean? I've mm. said this to you from the start, and mm. you, you very rarely get the opportunity to. But it's just. Everybody's living that their own particular mm. particular journey, and I'm saying that that was my experience. And with maturity now, you know, and you get a bit more relaxed as you get older, then it's easier to discuss it. But you mm. mentioned Dominic, or you mentioned Tom Dave. But the mm. point is that you can recognise those things for people because everybody loves the game. There's no one will sit down mm. with you for an interview who doesn't say they love the game. But yeah. sometimes the distraction and the challenges around it make it a lot more difficult to love it. And, and, and yeah. you, your perspective kind of changes on that. So I was a perfectionist, like even when I signed for Everton, like mm. I had no idea the environment I was stepping into, right? I didn't need fans to tell me I was shit because most of the time I was telling myself I was shit. But the point is if, I, if, if nine people came up to me after a game and told me I was good and one told me I was shit, that was the person I went home with. So when people talk about missing football, would you miss that? No. <laughs> The people can talk about money trappings, you know, acclaim, mm. which is which is lovely. But fundamentally, I'm kind of, I'm quite happy that that's not that's You're not the case being, now. No. You're yeah, but that becomes being. it's a different part of the story. But I'm saying, mm. in starting where you started with a particular phase and the time of a young yeah. boy leaving Dublin and coming away, and, yeah. you know, stepping into a world that he knew nothing about, nothing about. Mm. It was it, it was a difficult it was a difficult challenge. It was a difficult challenge. But I I I came I came through that. But like you say, it it became th that's how difficult it was. Mm. But with regards to the inner voice or having different conversations about, you know, a dark, dark place for me fundamentally at that time, 
the turning point for me was I thought if I do this, there will be another version of the story that won't deal with the real reasons I feel like this. Okay. And people will draw their own conclusion, which isn't the real conclusion. So I'm not prepared to do that. No, Does that make sense? Yeah, Does that make sense? So kind of Yeah, but that's a huge that's a huge inner strength. To, yeah, to yeah, turn yeah, yeah. And then go, well, okay, listen. I've no, but I was lucky yeah. though, as I was lucky because that was that was where I was able to kind of yeah, um, rationalise it in my mm. own mind that mm. if I do this, people will be blamed that aren't the people that should be blamed. So I can't. I okay. need to find a different way, and I, and, I, and I was able to do that. So yeah. nice, nice light start on a <laughs> yeah on a, on a Tuesday morning. All right, but, let's pick up. Let's pick up. So you, I mean, your debut for Villa. Are we are we saying that you didn't enjoy that then? No, no, no. Debut, time? debut for Villa, and again, you talk about the early fairy light stuff again, right? Mm. My my de- my full debut for mm. uh, Villa was Liverpool away. Okay, we got beat three nil. Mm. Okay, the assistant manager said to me, "The first ten minutes might be a bit challenging, but you'll feel okay after that." <laughs> it was three nil after eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Liverpool well, were very right good. Never yeah, got yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, but that yeah, that was yeah. so that was that was my kind of. Mm. Batish, full debut fire, yeah. if you like and mm-hmm. again I talk about relationships with coaches but I think at Villa I was on the bench 20 times that season mm. didn't come on a lot and then my home debut was against Everton okay. yeah your which team we, yeah which we, we Villa at the time we won 3-1 Villa mm. were very strong then like, yeah, that was yeah. a good time to be around Villa Yeah, you know Ron Atkinson 92-93 mm. yeah, yeah, was yeah. kind of challenged for the Premier League which mm. was when United you know right, yeah, the yeah, class yeah. of 92 had started to come through mm. We won a Coca-Cola Cup, I think mm. 95, you know, different mm. things were in the squad. It yeah. was quite funny because Lee, Lee Hendry and I mm. were the two players that I think it was still only three, four subs. So we were the two that didn't get stripped that day, but went <sighs> out, got changed and went out on Wembley, kicking the ball around an hour before the game, you know, different things. And yeah. then because of the coaching situation at Villa, I knew I wouldn't sign another contract there. Okay. So... I played against Everton and obviously got man of the match, did incredibly well. Mm -hmm. And whilst people would have heard about me, then you had, you know, you had evidence. Yeah. And fans started asking more and more about me. And I think initially Villa had offered me a contract, which was this, they'd offered me like another year, two years on the same money I was on. And then because I'd, you know, had visibility, they offered me like, there was another five contracts offered. But then Everton Mm -hmm. came in and it was like, once Everton came in, I knew I only wanted to play for Everton, so it kind of took care of itself. How did they come about then? Because I remember when I remember Howard had just come back to Everton, and it was that day. Was it? Yeah, he come back and it was he was signing this young player from Aston Villa, who people, you know, you weren't on everyone's lips. Of course, it was at that time, and everyone started thinking that oh, this is what Howard did the first and got these players who yeah, yeah. didn't know that much about, and this is all going to click into place and. We've got this young Irish left footer, so people that start looking at Kevin Sheedy, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and all that. It was, it was one of my one of my it, heroes growing up. I was going to say, yeah, the Irish connection with the left foot and all mm. that. And it was a, uh, but there was with the go to tribunal first. Yeah, 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 that, for yeah. another legal experience yeah. because again, this was the point with regards to Villa is that I had no commercial value whilst I was there. Right, but obviously after I left, all of a sudden you've got this club waxing lyrical about. How one of our you know, great but hopes, yeah, 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 one of the great hopes and yeah. what you were going to be. So we ended up having to drive down to the Bescott Stadium in Walsall one of the days to have a tribunal where I was given an opportunity to go in and give my give my position on yeah. my time at Villa. And it was quite funny because I think uh, Villa wanted two million at the time, mm. and I obviously did a good job because the tribunal decided on seven hundred thousand mm. to increase to nine hundred thousand based on appearances. So. My story Sorry, would have right? sounded better if it was two, two million, two million, <laughs> two, two million young player. But yeah, yeah. that was that, mm. that, that, and that was how that was because I still mm. felt really strongly that, you know, all of a sudden I had a commercial value. And this comes back to how football works again: is that yeah. you're a, you're a commodity in some ways. So I had had five years there. You know what I mean? Five years is a long time to be at a club. Mm. Had lots of challenges and difficulties there, but then all of a sudden they were talking about, you know, how I was one for the future and was a a big part of the plans and different things like that, which didn't coincide with conduct, you know, or or my experiences at the time. Mm. So So you you come to Everton, obviously, that, I mean, that's, Boyle Devertonian and coming to the yeah. it's coming and yeah. how it can which a lot of people though Baz it's quite funny because I know yeah. we've spoke about it yeah. but like a lot of people I'd speak to were like oh we never I never knew that like I never you know maybe, well, I, I, maybe know, I was terrible at yeah. articulating that See, but, yeah. you would have articulated that when you came 
I'd have got I'd more got, people. Yeah, I'd have got share. less. I'd have got less stick. You'd have got, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know what? It's, it's horrible to say, but you probably would have had no. Uh, a I'm, bit I, of an easier. I, I make a joke well. about it, but the, yeah, yeah. So no, since, you probably since, would have since '83. I'd started supporting so, Everton. Okay, so you... What a great time to support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, by the yeah, way, yeah. but... And obviously Howard Kendall, so yeah. you come back and it's Howard Kendall again. And you, but well, you that was the and, reason. Mm, that was the reason, yeah. the club and him. Yeah. So like you say, you go back to your school days again and this is the thing and I could mm. name the team off. You know, you'd write yeah. the team in the back of your school book again yeah. like this was... <laughs> you draw the badge, you know mm. what I mean? Everything was about, you know, everything, and it was interesting, dynamic, because of home. So you would be marketed like this now, in this Yeah, day. yeah, yeah. But yeah, well, yeah, Gorby, yeah, Gareth, com- yeah completely Blue. different. But, like, mm. everyone at home would have been Man United, Liverpool supporters. Yeah, we were, yeah. Cel- we're all Celtic fans, do you know yeah. what I mean? But outside of that, everything, you know, I loved the kit, you know, everything about it. Yeah, and then, yeah. obviously, that became that became kind of my team then. Yeah. yeah, so it was the best time, you know, with mm. regards to Everton's history for some of the younger people watching or listening like yeah. they never got to experience that oh. which is like which is incredible it's crazy, isn't they, it? they they know the memory of it or yeah. they, like you say Howard's way they'll have seen it but yeah. n- not not actually living it so yeah. it was fascinating 83, yeah. 84, 85 and then into the kind of the second group if yeah. you like which mm. won two leagues mm. FA Cups and different isn't? things and like I was, I was I was a massive fan so what was it like signing for Everton then and coming into coming into that and being how were you feeling yourself because obviously you've had this we just saw no 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 that, that, yeah that was that that was gone so like you say yeah you, no, but you, yeah, but you have you have it, it, it's new and it's exciting mm, yeah do you know what I mean Belfield like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. All, all of yeah. all of those things yeah. so like but in being a fan you never given any thought to how challenging the previous couple of years had been for yeah. people so it's like mm. football you know we, we we talk about it as a team game but it's an incredibly individual team game and we talk about dressing rooms environments or insecurity that comes with football mm. so it it was different because I was stepping into a whole new whole new club whole new environment one that had been struggling mm. so also you didn't have kind of the buffer if you like a villa would have been a top 6 team you were coming on for the olays or you were playing in a completely different environment yeah. to a team that was you know Totally struggling yeah, and yeah, yeah. whilst being an Everton fan I still don't think I understood like the intensity of Liverpool mm. and I think like it probably you know you live here now and it's your home yeah. and you're, you you know what I mean you wouldn't yeah, yeah. have it any other way but the point is that I probably didn't you know really really understand that intensity Yeah, and you they teach difficult. you. They can teach you quick. Yeah. You learn. You learn. You learn quite quickly. So you again, quickly. having been a fo- footballer, and you kind of judge yourself on you know assists, spin on the ball, shot score, whatever. Yeah. Playing in a team that struggling was mm. w- w- was difficult, and it was difficult for everybody. So again, not for me, but mm. like young players. You know, we talk about parallels. Young players with lots of potential coming into a team that's struggling. Yeah. It can be a little bit more difficult. Yeah. John Oster was John there. Oster, yeah. You know what I mean? Different people. So. Mm different people that weren't used to it. So everybody, again, will have a different story or snapshot of what that was like. But mm. my first thought was, I'm going to be playing for Everton. It's all I ever That's dreamt about doing. Yeah. I joke with people now, we talk about being a lawyer, but I signed a blank contract and went back to Dublin. The agent hadn't finished negotiating. I want, I just wanted <laughs> to play. I just wanted to play for Everton. Exactly. I got home late on that. I think it was a Friday night after meeting with Howard mm. or whenever he'd been announced. And the next morning I had a call like from Newcastle want to meet you and it was like we've been trying to get your number for weeks you know wow. and then it was well I'm, I'm sorry no. I've just signed for Everton yesterday yeah. that was that was it that was it incredible and I, and not that the contract got any better Baz, but my point was it's more like that that was it was once, was once Everton were there there was other clubs there was mm. other you know everybody we read about it all the time now about you know agents putting pieces in papers yeah, or yeah. other clubs linked or he's waiting to hear from such and such but mm. you know it was an easy decision. Yeah. And thankfully, I mean, you've scored. Well, only like, with the outcome. Well, only with the outcome, not not necessarily the well, season. Listen, you come in and it was, I mean, if, if you'd have been, if you'd have come in a year before Joe Royal was the manager, obviously we just finished sixth and things were looking up. And I mean, even the Christmas before you come in, Everton, I remember Everton were tipped dark horses for the league. They were fourth. In the league and going really well, and then Joe Parkinson got injured and things, and then all of a sudden, everything fell apart very quickly. Joe went into sign a player and ended up resigning and went, and then we struggled. Dave Watson got us through, and then obviously Howard come in, and you come into that, and you're right, you come in John Oster, people like that, a lot of young players. Everyone, I don't, I think the, the issue I think for Evertonians at that time was we were 
just expecting the bounce to go back to the year before the yeah. six and be challenging for Europe yeah. and all of that. And it, I would have happily should... accepted any well, bounce. Yeah, you, yeah, anything. Yeah. But mm. you scored your first goal against Scunthorpe. Yeah, at Goodison doesn't doesn't get enough credit. Doesn't it doesn't it was away. Blank, away, you won one nil away. You Blanford scored Park. Yeah, yeah, you scored the winner. No one uh, really talks about that one a lot. No, well that was important because it's no, sold no, no. But I'm saying yeah, but I'm saying for me mm, again, for you. you're a first team player, mm. so like you're in the first team all yeah, the time. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it was it was it was it was it was a positive start. But again, it was yeah. it was a uh, one goal that. Didn't the second one didn't come or the third one didn't come really really quickly and it, like it quickly became quite a winner. challenging season. Yeah, yeah. You were never so ever yeah. player. You but scored against the Scott winner. Top. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. We got, we got winner. into the next round. Of the we cup beat on them that five basis. nil at home. John Oster scored a chip for the fifth. I remember <clears> that one. <throat> good as it was a peach. And but you played. I mean, you you were in the side and it was no 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 yeah. Play. But it, it, it was like it was a challenging time for everybody. Mm. And again, like this is we, we can talk about the current you know challenges mm-hmm. at the club. But the mm. point is that Everton is a it's a tough place to play. It's mm. a demanding place to play for people that mm. you know even the strongest will admit that yeah. it brings different challenges. And I, I I think having gone through difficulties of that season to have the outcome we did, mm. but also I did, was obviously a tipping point that you would have anticipated and hoped as you go into a new season not that you've built up some collateral mm. you know what I mean but that it would have been a little bit easier but then obviously Howard was removed and then Walter mm. Smith came in let's so. let's just go to the we've got listen I can't sit here opposite you without talking about the Coventry game I know you've had a, you've had a tough season yep and we've come to that game yeah obviously Coventry City and believe it or not it the one game I missed all season so it was your fault it was my fault we went to Florida <laughs> And so nineteen. It's a fair trade off, though. Well, Florida, it wasn't bad. Yeah, 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 you know, I was thinking, well, if we get relegated, that the best place to be will be yeah. miles away from this. And um, no internet. You know, got the fit. It was what me, was the internet then? Was it? Mate, you it have was, a coat hanger. Yeah, that was like, what it was. Yeah. You just got it. Yeah. Well, it was the BBC, BBC, whatever. We were in. My mate lives over there, and um, we were going. We were going to Daytona or something. Whatever. No clear water. We were going. But I said I need to, I need to watch the first fifteen minutes on the computer before we leave. So I've just got scores up with the buffering. Though so how long did it take? It was like yeah, yeah, and I'm waiting, and you scored early on, and it comes up one nil Farrelly. Yeah, running. You obviously, thought the, the program there was something not quite right thinking, with the program on that basis. That, yeah, 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 yeah. That, sure can't, up, that can't be right. <laughs> well, when I saw it was a right foot folly, yeah, I thought, well, hang on, right foot with instead yeah. of that peg, the left peg. But I mean, what a what what was that like as a day? Uh, Michael Ballin recently, and he was talking about he was young, and it was just like yeah, I just wanted to get on with it. Yeah, yeah, what, but ba- ball, ball, he had done really, really well mm. that season because mm. again, as a young player, he'd come through, you know, the academy, if you yeah. like, and the U team. Mm. He was he, he and was he let excellent everyone when he know he's an Evertonian. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was one of the major one of the major flaws <laughs> in the plan. Yeah, yeah, but I think retrospectively, you look back on these things. Mm. I think pressure is a funny thing, mm. right? So again, amidst all of the things we discuss, but it, I, I really, I love that. Yeah. Okay. So, having had the difficulties, so like yeah. you say, we can joke about it, you know, show re- goalkeeper show reels or hit the corner flag or hit the stand, whatever. Mm. But the point was, I would always say, even to people now, you have to keep, keep going. Yeah. People measure bravery different ways, no, right? Absolutely. So yeah. kicking someone up into the stand and kissing the badge. Mm. Whilst the fans might turn around and go, oh, he's one of us. Yeah. That's not necessarily bravery. No. And the dressing room looks upon people in different ways, right? Mm. That the people you look to in a dressing room might not necessarily be the people that the fans believe so, are mm. the people you look to, right? Mm. So for me, it was always, if I get an opportunity to play, which which I wanted to, and mm. Howard used to tell a story about I wasn't playing the day before, but he had a dream that I was going to score and that... He changed the team the next day or whatever, right? Be that true or not. You you speak about it quite a lot. Mm. But the point was, I was excited to be playing. And mm. then you keep believing that if you keep doing the right things, mm. then there's a chance that it, it will turn around and go in your favour. So the Absolutely. point is that we can sit here and talk about whatever you want to talk about, right? But 1998, 25 years in, we're still having a conversation about a snapshot mm. in the history of the club I supported as a boy that had a big outcome. So mm. how cool is that? And mm. I probably never appreciated it because your career and your life moves on, but I appreciated it more last year because kind of my son yeah. and different people were looking at the situation again and going, you know, my dad did that. Yeah. So it's different. So mm. it was a massive thing to be a part of. But again, 
having, you know, missed, come close, mm. been under an incredible pressure for the mm. duration of that season to get an outcome like that was massive. But yeah. again, you'll speak to everybody who'll have their own version of that day, of that season, mm. Bawley, you know what I mean? Yeah. You talk about Nev, you talk about Thomas Myra, you talk mm. about people in that season, Nicky Barnby, Danny yeah. Kadamatri, you talk about everyone will have their own story. And that's, that's, what's, that's what's beautiful about football, isn't it? Mm. It's beautiful about the game. So the point is, it was a really, really positive outcome for me because... I hadn't contemplated relegation. It, yeah. it, it was an impossibility for me as an Everton yeah. fan. How could that be? Yeah. How could, you know, the history of Everton, the club you support. So mm. people talked about, you know, a releg I, I that wasn't even on my radar, yeah. if you like, or discussed, contemplated different things. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was a funny week and there's always different stories. You know, we stayed in Parkgate. You know, people will talk about that intensity was different mm. and has been for the fans the last kind of 18 months, you know, about waiting for the bus to come in or, you know, all of the different yeah. things that have happened. Mm -hmm. But that day was weird because you left Parkgate and there was people out on the street. You know, you felt You don't have ice cream, Don Hutchison said, Howard said, Did he? Ice I, I, cream I, well, I wasn't a part like of that, that ice cream. I wasn't a part of the ice cream school. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying that yeah. it was different. It was mm -hmm. intense and it becomes a really, really, you know, great story to tell yeah. people. But as soon as you got to Goodison and I think what's interesting about a fan base who loves their club right which all clubs will say that I think the place was nearly full at 20 past 3 mm. and you know you kind of thought right well hang on this has been a hostile place but it's yeah. like there was a what, a quiet agreement that what's gone before doesn't really matter the most important thing is that it's you not. back the team to stay up so you, mm. you had I'm sure people will say the atmosphere was probably like that last year but mm. again it was just an incredible atmosphere, environment mm. from the warm-up, you know. Yeah. The youth team had won the FA Youth Cup. They yeah, came onto the yeah. pitch. The women had won the league. They came onto the pitch and you were thinking, wow, this is this is going to be a special day. Mm. And like Coventry were a very, very good team then. Mm. If you think back to the yeah, players in the yeah, team, yeah. it wasn't a given, but the point was at no point would I have contemplated that we wouldn't stay up. Yeah. Which is easy to say now, isn't it? But you know what I mean? At the time, it became, it became a massive... Massive thing, mm. something that I'm incredibly proud of. Yeah. But football, which has a habit of continuing to kick you in the balls, new mm. manager came in and said, you can leave. I, th I mean... So I played eight minutes. So people talk yeah. about uh, making a career out of your highest achievements and accomplishments. But mm. I played I played a Carl well equivalent Carling Cup game. I think mm. we played Oxford at home 1-0, mm. which was that game where managers always played the players that hadn't played any games yeah. so if you didn't do well they could turn around and say don't come knocking Told on my you. door saying you should play and then I think I came on as a sub against Newcastle and didn't play for the whole season so football's realities so, whereas if Howard had, if Howard had stayed maybe it would have been different but yeah you, you, that's that's how, how football works it, for, for players you can be like you say you can be at the, the top you know enjoying your you know achievements mm. if you like and, and and everything changed for me after that goal mm. in that respect because yeah. like you say it was so, it, was, it was such a big a, a, a big thing it's huge but, yeah. it's, it's history we've, we've yeah. seen it I mean no know, but that was the nice thing again last mm. year you look at like Decore's goal which was awesome as well and you mm. look at the pressure they were under and obviously you can relate to that mm. but the point is more so that you would you're they're still you know even on an image they're putting something next to that that happened 20, 25 years yeah, ago. Absolutely, yeah. So. Incredible. And then obviously, how did they go? Walter Smith come in and, and like you say, things changed. And how how frustrating was that? And was there a was there a reason why? No, why just football. Felt... Just just opinion. Yeah. Opinion. Just but again, yeah, opinion. yeah, yeah. So like again, youth is wasted on the young. I mm. made bad decisions as well. You know. Okay. You're back to where we start. You know, you're a footballer. You're fit. You want to play, but all of a sudden, you're not. You're not playing. Mm. But then, not only are you not playing, because they want rid of you, you're no longer allowed at the training ground. You're training at, you know, really? yeah, yeah, you're training at Netherton with the youth team. So you become somebody else's mm. headache. You lose your place in the national squad. So like, it brings a whole host of different challenges around that. So mm. that, but that was a year where I where I didn't play. Why weren't you allowed to train? Because he didn't want us at he the training ground. Not, yeah. It's like it's these things still happen now. They're mm. probably more refined now, mm. and it's probably more difficult to do because of the level of money that people are earning. But the mm. point was that you he know, just made we, yeah, we'll up. try and but we'll also try and upset them that they'll Deal that they'll leave. So I think I spent in my career, I spent more time with the youth teams than I did in the first <laughs> team. So we were we, we became Colin Harvey's problem mm. at Netherton. So there was again there was a group of young players then that were like exceptional. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But who who weren't playing? 
weren't playing football, some of whom had just won the Youth Cup, mm. who were obviously young pros, but then there was like senior pros as well that weren't a part of the plans and were left to kind of... Get on with yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So part, it's part and parcel of the game, but mm. if you're on the wrong end of it, then it, it just it becomes a little bit challenging. Absolutely. And then obviously... What? So the second season, Baz, it was yeah, quite funny. Sorry, just as no, go on, you talk about sad. stories. So yeah, like, go on. Pre-season started like the 7th of July mm. and like we were in on the 14th of June running around Crocky Park because that was another means of like trying to frustrate and wow. get people to leave. So there's people out walking their dogs around Crocky Park and there was a group of players that weren't in the manager's plans Just brought back to train two and a half, three weeks before everybody else getting sent pictures of lads with, you know, having their drinks and their pina coladas away whilst we were we were running around. So That's just... That's grim. Yeah, part of the game, but it's a, it's a test. The game is always game is always yeah. testing you. It is sad, isn't it? That I mean, I think this you know not the first time I'll have ever said this, and I won't. I'm certainly not the only person. But it's like when when they want you, they're falling all over themselves, and the minute they make a decision, you you know. You, yeah, yeah, you just yeah, cut, yeah, You don't. Yeah, yeah. And I know it's, you can it's say a commodity in many ways, it. and you can say it's oh, well, it's just rude. I mean, I'm I've heard this, and it does just get bandied around like it's easy to oh well it's ruthless football you just have to accept it you know? mm, no it's, it's part it's, I think know. it's there's there's a there's an acceptance it's part of the game isn't it it's part of the game but again it's the, it's the dark part that people don't really mm. like to relate but when you experience it that's it's that's the, that's the experience the, there's a obviously there's a twist isn't it that the next your next club is the club you've literally just rele- <laughs> you just relegated yeah. with Everton obviously Bolt Wanderers which they like to remind they, me of they, in they the first still, few weeks yeah. of me being there. Well, yeah, yeah, listen, yeah. at the end of the day, you you done your job for us, and yeah, and I don't think they there. I don't think they saw it as that. But again, mm. it had been such a challenging time, and with training with the youth team, I was still driving to Sheffield, Don Valley, twice a week to the stadium there to train with a fitness coach who was a friend of mine. Okay, because I want you know I want I wanted to be fit, and I yeah. wasn't training at a level you know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah kept me ready to be able to play again. Okay. Right? Yeah. So Sam Allardyce left Notts County to go in as the Bolton manager mm. and he, he had spoken to my friend who was sports sports scientist yeah. and he said like we need I need need some players mm. and he, he mentioned me and obviously the feedback was that I was exceptionally talented but high maintenance which <laughs> was probably a nice way of putting it yeah. and he was like just take him and he was like well he's not fit he's not been playing and he was mm. like well no he's, he's driven of his own volition to Sheffield twice a week for the last six months to train with me mm. he'll, he'll be fine mm. so I think I signed on loan on the Friday trained on the Saturday and Bolton was the weirdest place I'd ever been because nobody was speaking on the Saturday but what had happened was Andy Todd had had a an altercation with Phil Brown that week okay which was quite a big issue mm. and played against Sheffield United on the Sunday right. it was like a parolee because again you were back to being a footballer again scored yeah. early on in the game as well 1-2-1 one, one, and it was like great I'm, I'm back playing oh, again yeah. so you're happy to step down a league yeah. but you just wanted to play and yeah. I think that's what everybody will tell you mm. and then first home game people were still talking about you're the guy that got us relegated so you end up thinking oh, oh my god this yeah. is like this is kind of Madness, really. Yeah. There was no um, goal line technology then, if you remember, because yeah. I think Everton played in the first game at the Reebok Stadium mm. at the time. Terry Phelan headed one off the line that had actually gone over the line. I was so there was a whole host of grievances that were presented to me at different times as to I do have why a, Bolton should have stayed up. And I Everton. do have a theory with that. that with a, it was a foul on Neville Sharp. <laughs> okay, so it shouldn't have been a goal. And Bolton got a goal at Aston Villa that didn't cross the line that season. And so, many beat Villa. So, so as no matter what we talk no about now in technology, it all levels itself. It levels out itself yeah, out. Yeah, 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 perfectly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think you'd listen. You had a good time at Bolton. I had five certainly, years there. Yeah. So I, w- I was Sam's first signing. You mm-hmm. know, you stepped down. Did there he have that dodgy moustache? Because he had it at the yes, end of the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. From from the start. Yeah. And there was there was still some incredibly talented players there. Mm-hmm. People that had stayed with the club when they'd got relegated. Yeah. We didn't go up the fourth season. We got mm-hmm. beaten by Ipswich in the playoffs. Yeah. And again, I was kind of in and out of the team because my first week, within my first week at Bolton, my, my old man died of had a heart attack and passed away. So I, I, I played on the Sunday. Obviously, I was buzzing, scored one, mm. back being a footballer again, and then got a phone call on the Thursday to say, you have to come home, he's he's had a heart attack. I mean, he passed away, which was incredibly challenging. And then kind of that season was in and out of the team. Yeah. They lost a lot of players then. But 
hit on a group and a formula where we got promoted through the playoffs. It was a very, very strong championship then. You had Fulham. Mm. Jean Tigana was in at Fulham. Yeah. Graham Souness was at Blackburn. Incredibly strong teams. And yeah. then got promoted and we're, we're in the Premier League. Hang on. Let, okay. I love the fact you just skated over we got promoted. There is a little issue of a, a playoff final at the Millennium Stadium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Farrelly, a right-footed again from the edge of the penalty area for the first goal. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I would probably say that in a footballing context, that was when you know, it was one of the best times I had mm. because the sports scientist who I'd worked with since I was 20 yeah. was at Bolton. Okay. So I got to work with him every day. Brilliant. Right? And I played the most football I played. Mm. So this is the irony of a 16-year prof- sixteen year professional playing career. Is I started the season twice. Yeah. 16 years. Yeah, yeah. One was at Bolton that mm. year and then the other was at Everton, which was mm. Crystal Palace at home. We got beat 2-1. And Lombardo. that out of 16 years. Lombardo, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but again, we should never have lost no. at the time. So I'm saying that I, it was it, it was a happy time. But what mm. was interesting for me was it was always different challenges that season. You know, we weren't going to stay up or such and such was the yeah. key player. Such and such was the thing. And we played Preston. And obviously we'd beaten Preston comfortably. Moises, yeah, I'd Preston. Score, and I'd scored against them in the season and all mm. of that type of stuff. So there was different battles set out as being the key battles. And I, you, you were just, I, I, I was ready. So it was... Wembley was being redeveloped. Mm. Stayed, you know, it was at Millennium Stadium. It was incredible. We we won well, deserved to win, and then you were back in the Premier League again. So not only did you score the right-footed goal in the edge of the box, you also an assist for Michael. Ricketts. Yeah, before assists were assists. It yeah, was yeah, a yeah. tremendous, yeah, yeah. but it was a tremendous ball. Yeah, but Michael Thanks Ricketts for... had a tremendous season that year because yeah. again, it was good business from Sam. He'd taken him, you mm. know, from Walsall. Yeah, and again, they'd paid a, a, sm- a small fee for him, but he he he, he was exceptional. Mm. And there was some standout players there, mm. you know, who who I very experienced at, did really really well. Looking at the team, you've had the uh, Goodney Bergson. Yeah, Goodney Kevin was Goodney Nolan. was awesome. Kevin had started to break through that season. Pierre Franson. Yeah. Uh, Gardner, the winger. Yeah, Ricardo Gardner. Yeah, Dean Holdsworth. Yeah, yeah. Michael Ricketts, Colin Hendry. Yeah, all so, people you know. that like contributed massively mm. then. And, mm. and and I think what was interesting for Bolton then was no sooner had we got promoted than everybody was talking how that was the team that would be relegated by Christmas. <laughs> mm. And then after the first four games of the Premier League, there were we were top of the Premier League. Mm. So it was just it was just a, di- a different time. Yeah, like you say, I I fell out with Sam after that. I was going to say so. Out of some the the fella who's relegated Bolton then got them promoted again yeah goal and they, st- they still seem to focus on the first part of the well, story they, but... well that's just that's just the game isn't it um, you know we've just looking here 18 appearances in the first Premier League season second season 8, eight appearances and a goal um, and the goal at Highbury yes yeah. Defo meant it yeah of in course a, yeah, in but... a week where people were talking about Mudrick against Arsenal did he mean it and all that? You de- I defo seen a little glance when you knocked it over David yeah, Seaman's yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much as my publicist. <laughs> that sounds really, really promising. Um, well, so, so you see, you yeah, but again, as is the case in my career, when I reflect, obviously, lobbing Seaman, I wasn't the first person to do it. Ronaldinho had done it just before that. So yeah, it, it obviously didn't have, the same, didn't have the same draw as that. But that, yeah. that, that, this is the thing again about decision making so football mm. fundamentally from a player point of view is about decision making yeah, making yeah. better decisions not only on the pitch but off it yeah, right? so sure. so Sam and I had fallen out and I was out of the team again and I think it was a, it was a strange why did you fall out lots of different reasons because I was a perfectionist again okay. so if it's something not because of his moustache no 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 I'd, I'd, I, was, would have been I was willing I was willing to, yeah I was willing to pass on his moustache or whatever <laughs> but again within that personality it, it can be destructive so the mm. point is you, you think you're doing things but fundamentally the only person that suffers is yourself so okay. if I'd, I I've always been fascinated with football because it's like jersey swapping people will talk about the end of a career so we got back into the Premier League mm. and sometimes when you're quite analytical in your mind you do an assessment on an opposition right and you'd yeah. be thinking I'm not going to win today okay. right because they're better than us mm. or they're this or that and I, yeah. I, I didn't like that yeah right Yeah. but then I couldn't contemplate going to a player before a game and saying, can I have your jersey? Okay, yeah. And if that person beat me, I then was not going to bring that jersey home, frame it and put it on my wall. It just, I I see no reason for it. If I lost, I'd invariably go home, pull the curtains and it would take me two days to to get over losing. Right? So even within Bolton, Sam understood that he couldn't change everything straight away. 
mm-hmm. and obviously did an incredible job there. Yeah. But for me at the time, as a player, you wanted things to be a different way. Yeah. So you fall out and then again, who suffers, you fall out of the team. So from a statistical and analytical point of view, we had Prozone. I would have been very, very, you know, au fait with how all of those things yeah. work, stats. Yeah. And I wanted to see them. I thrived on, you know, the information yeah. and the knowledge. But the yeah. point again would be, I've played seven games now and I ain't won. I've played seven, I've played eight, I've lost seven and I've drawn one. Mm. I've played 10. Not happy. I've drawn, yeah, 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 really unhappy. But like saying, mm. well, if I can see this, fans are going to see this well and then they go, well, we're not winning and he's playing. Mm. Now, it wasn't that oh, the team okay. wasn't winning. It was The you. team wasn't winning. Yeah, but you, you, I would carry that. I would carry that and it would be like blatant to me that I've played 10 games and I've won one. So I would, I would find it very difficult. So then I would be critical of things that I perceived weren't being done as I thought they should be. Okay. And then I would suffer because the manager doesn't have just one player to worry about. He's got to worry about okay. a team, a squad and keeping was his own no, job. Was there no psychology? Yeah, there, there was people. There yourself. was some brilliant people. There was some brilliant people at Bolton. But again, Bolton, that was the start of a journey for them. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? And yeah, I think it's yeah. interesting now because if you look at managers that have enjoyed relative success, some of them have probably started in League One. If you look mm. at Chris Wilder, if you look at... Yeah, yeah. Uh, the spirit of Santos when he was at Wolves. Mm. So they get a bit of time to build a momentum. So they they get promoted out of League One, then they have a standout season in the Mm. Championship and then their first season in the Premier League is, you know, deemed successful. So again, they're all my own issues, Baz. They're all my own issues. I'm not saying anybody else, but the point is, invariably then over time, you fall out of the team. And first off, you kind of think, conflict again, because it's like you've left me out, there's other people who aren't performing. So it becomes back to... You know, football, it's easy, butting heads. So, like, that Arsenal was hilarious because we talk about stories. There was a game that Bolton were playing in Ballymena United, which was to open the stand. Okay. Right? Yeah. And I played and I scored two. We won 2-0 and I scored two. Mm. And I came back and, for me, Sam was there because it was, you know, opening the stand as a part of the thing. And I wanted, I played incredibly well and it was kind of like, well, I'll show you. Mm. You know what I mean? So again, you're creating conflict when there doesn't need to be a conflict, right? But the point is, we came back and there was some suspensions and then all of a sudden I trained with the first team on the Friday and I was thinking, right, okay, interesting. And then travel, I was part of the squad and I'm Mm. thinking, right, okay, interesting. And then on the Saturday, I was selected to play against Arsenal. Mm. So, you know, so you end up scoring, but we lost 2-1, late mm. goal. You know what I mean? So you think, and then you're back in the fold again. Nice. But the issues are still the same. Course, so like yeah. I played four or five games, but the point was he had his players that he had a preference for at okay. that time. So yeah. if if you drop slightly below that standard. You're the easy drop. Yeah, 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 which is, mm. which is part and parcel of the game again. Mm. So that was kind of our, how the relationship was like, so okay. I've seen him since yeah. Razum, and, and we're you know what I mean we're you good know, like, we're yeah. good and we've had some you know brilliant get togethers with him and brilliant conversations but the point again is that you know at that time my decision making wasn't very good and okay. I got distracted too easily and like you say I walked out of the Premier League at 28 so if you look at that now like so basically my position was I've had good bad and different managers mm-hmm. I'm not in love with this anymore and that was when I Obviously, moved back to Bohemians as, as player manager because I thought, yeah. well, you had loans. I mean, six games for Rotherham, twelve for Burnley, fourteen for Bradford, yeah, seven appearances at Wigan. Yeah, but that was because my left. desire to not be at Bolton was such that I took you loan deals. Yeah, yeah, and you do you, you make bad their bad decisions. Mm. So, like you say, Burnley was it was a different loan because it was close. You yeah. know what I mean? So you were like, I was happy to go there, yeah. but I was played out of position then and decided I'm not I don't want to stay here anymore yeah. which I returned to Bolton which Sam Allardyce's position was you can't even stay on loan that was that, the deterioration of the relationship then yeah. you know the Rotherham one I'd been there when I was at Villa yeah, which was yeah. which was the best time I Your ever had goals yeah yeah but the best, best time I ever had in fo- one of the best times I ever had in football and I didn't appreciate their careers at the time but Archie Gemmell and John McGovern were the managers so like you're talking about absolute football legends yeah, yeah. but these were two managers that used to say to me before a game just go out and play just go out and show people did what you, you feel, show us did oh, you feel confident amazing I'd have stayed there Yeah, I'd have stayed there at the end of the loan I was like how can I stay here mm. and they're like you can't you can't, you can't, you can't afford, afford it <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but like that was, that was an amazing mm. time so I went back there on loan Ronnie mm. Moore was there you know at the manager at the time and played mm. but again you're talking about the logistics of you know 
you're committed to playing, but the yeah. point is that you're doing it in a different way because yeah. you just don't want to be at your, you know. at, at your club. So yeah. like the loan, there was lots of loans and lots of different things and lessons. Bradford was incredible. Brian mm. Robson was the manager. Um, mm. Colin Todd, joint manage, managerial team. And it was a team that was struggling and we did really well. But mm. then obviously the club went into admin. So again, they couldn't afford me. So it was back to Bolton again. And that was around the time that Bolton were doing well, but mm. they, they got to the Carling Cup final yeah. against Middlesbrough. Mm. And again, you'll speak to lots of different players, right? But if you weren't in a team or if you weren't playing, you didn't want people to win. You just, well, yeah, you're like, that's, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Or, 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 if someone's playing in your position, you wanted them to be shit because you wanted to be able to prove that I'm better, <laughs> I'm be better there. than this person. Mm. And that's, and, and, and that was how it was. But I think but, that is, people might be surprised by that. Fans, because you go, you will always look at it from your point of view. But as a player, I think, I think everyone who's ever kicked the football and has been part of a team and has been sub will always want the, uh, I remember playing and, and I got bollocked that on the bench because <laughs> I was laughing when one of the strikers, Mr. Sitter, yeah, good, manager, good. took a strip yeah, yeah. off me uh-huh. while I come on and scored and then give it the all. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dropped again. No, you're, no, you're right. Yeah, but listen, it's the, that's just part of yeah, it's the fascinating part of human nature, right? And, I, and I've thought about this quite a lot. But again, there's an immaturity to that. that yeah, absolutely. That, that yeah. I probably, I was never... I'm I, admitting I, No, 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 no. But I think now, I, I look I look at it now and I kind of think that I look at some of the teams that I would look to, I look up to, mm. and I think there's a collective around yeah, that yeah, and yeah. there's a kind of, there's a value system in place yeah. that if you're not playing, then you still buy into the mm. the greater good, if you like. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I didn't really have that as a personality. It was like, I wanted to be the best. If I wasn't the best, I didn't want the person in my position playing well, winning, because that justified them mm. in no, some ways. I, I think there's a, I think there's a good, Listen, you're right, and there's a lot of education around that, and they spoke about a lot more the importance of the squad and what. All. But years ago, it was the importance of the team. Yeah, but even now, when people say that, they don't really mean. No, it. of course yeah, they don't. At the end of the day, if you're sub all the time, yeah, yeah, you're not exactly. getting a game. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's yeah, great, yeah. the group and all yeah, that. It's yeah. not the group; it's about the, the lads who no. start. Yeah, come, come completely. And completely. you've got to have that. Yeah, but that's you have that, that selfishness. That's why you. Yeah, 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 football. yeah. Very much so. But I'm saying again, as you get older, this comes back to buying, you know, have, being in an environment that's probably bigger than yourself, which is slightly yeah. different. And, and and I think I may have enjoyed patches of that, but I don't think I was ever in an environment that totally reflected that. So slightly well, well, different. You've gone from there to be the player manager at Bohemian. Yeah. So your, your club, your home. Yeah, time, home yeah. club. But again, as a as a young player, right? And this mm. is why I look at managers now, young managers who start out and see how incredibly difficult it can be because there's a naivety to that. Mm. So again, an, a lack of experience as to yeah. how it really works. You've mm. got strong values and strong ideas, but fundamentally the question is whether you're going to be able to implement them or not. Yeah. So I went home to Bohemians because in many ways it was, I've had good, bad managers. Now I can go home and I can be my own manager, mm. but I'm also going to, look to develop young Irish talent because I believe, it, you believe in that. young Irish talent and I still believe in that massively now. Yeah. But you inherit a chairman and a board of directors. Mm. So Bohemians was slightly different because it was a members own club, which okay. means there was kind of directors of each particular department. Right, okay. And within kind of six weeks of being there, they called me to a board meeting to tell me like, we're really sorry we've speculated with the previous manager hugely yeah. and we haven't been successful. So we're not going to be able to give you the budget that we had agreed. So again, advising someone now, you would probably say, you need to make a decision as to whether you want to stay yeah. commit to this. Mm. Whereas I was naive and saying, well, I think I can still, still do what do I've it. set out to do. Mm. I had 12 players out of contract and I was able to keep two. Okay. Issue. Yeah, yeah massive, <laughs> massive issue. Massive issue on what would have been a really, really strong competitive squad before that. Yeah. And then, you know, you're having to think in different ways as to how you can possibly be successful. So yeah. I took a top under 18 team who had right. won the national tournament, had a lot of really, really talented young players in as the 21s, knowing that I probably had a strong 12 okay. and that if I needed, you know, help that those yeah. young players then could start to be introduced. So okay. I did it for two years. It was an, yeah. it was an incredible learning curve, mm. but probably one of the most difficult things I ever did because if your castle is built on sand, then you have very little chance of being successful of course, yeah. against, you know, competitors mm. as well, who, who, who had more money at the time, mm. who had more resources, but fundamentally Bohemians is a huge club and there's, there's a massive expectation that even though, you know, 
they didn't have the same resources, the expectation yeah. would have still been the same. So I, 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 oh, I was sure. naive mm -hmm. as I didn't understand the media, you know, I never yeah. understood it in football, how, how it works. Mm -hmm. I would have I would have kept a lot of the things in, dealing with the board, different challenges, non-payment mm -hmm. of wages, players leaving, you know, a whole host of legal issues that presented themselves all the time. So it was like two years firefighting. Yeah, so, it is impossible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Over, yeah it, it is because again, when you're the player as well, you know, it's difficult. It was difficult to kind of manage all of that stuff. I look back. On, I, well, I look back on lots of things now. I can't really remember them per se. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm saying it. It was, you know, the fans, you know, would not look back upon that time in any way positively. But there was unique challenges presented themselves, mm. and I would do things differently now. Mm. Do you know what I mean? How would you handle Gareth Farley? Gareth Farrelly, mm. yeah, but I'd be well capable of dealing with him now. Well, but yeah. I, yeah, he would still fall under the category of high maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> but but f but from a playing point of view, so 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 just lots lots of different challenges, and yeah. I look back now, and I I'm still having the same conversations about Irish football that we had in two thousand and four to two thousand and six. Do you know what I mean? So like, and I also resources and things yeah, like yeah, yeah. same like Infra Roy Keane, in infrastructure, infrastructure, resources, yeah. quality, coaching, development, mm. you know, leadership, the whole the whole thing. No, like, we've moved forward, like. 20 years, nearly mm. 20 years and mm. still having the same conversations. Yeah. So I don't believe we were wrong in what we tried to do and I don't mm. believe the vision was wrong. Okay. I just think timing was a massive part in that. Yeah. So it was, it became quite funny and also the only people I would probably feel bad about is I signed, you know, players or I brought staff in mm. that I sold them on the vision that I had mm. but then I, I resigned from that. You know what I mean, and and they're they're still the people that some I, there was some exceptional people I worked mm. with players. You know, mm. Bohemians were full time. There was players who were part time who were more dedicated than the full time ones. You know, I got to see Dublin GA up close, and mm. again they were more professional than some of the professional footballers. Their mentality was incredible. Their attitude was incredible. So you were trying to impart things, but mm. all the time fighting fires so the point yeah. was it was like someone giving you a band-aid and saying stand on the beach and say stop the tide coming in yeah you know what i mean it, it, it wasn't going to happen at that mm. time but some of the people i worked with if you think moved into saint kevin's boys yeah right and they produced in the 10 years from my time at bohemians an incredible schoolboy club but produced five full internationals so you know yeah. when you talk about can it be done? And yeah. it's one of the things I'm really interested in now because you look at how successful the rugby team have been in the World yeah. Cup, yeah. but not a lot of people have joined the dots up and gone, well, what can we take from what rugby do Some well? That, yeah. As opposed to looking at a football situation that is in a poor state at the moment. Mm. So it's my home. That's you know, a hotbed you know, of, of footballers when you look back. Massively on so. Tremendous yeah, massively so. Back. Now people will talk about how the game has changed globally, but the point is that talent is still there, but mm -hmm. it needs to be nourished, cultivated yeah. mm. and developed properly. And, 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 and the people are there as well. There's been such a, a brain drain of people that have mm. left football because of where it's at. Yeah. So, so that, was the, that was the Bohemians plan. Yeah. It didn't work. You know what I mean? But the point was, you, you reflect again and you kind of think, I'm not saying it in any way, you went without wages. Mm. You know what I mean? You were asking people to give a level of commitment when they didn't know if their mortgage was going to be paid. There was people able to leave the club for nothing because the club hadn't carried out you know what they said what they said they would do so you were before the game you were dealing with things that you thought you're back to why have i got no energy again yeah 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 so i so, so i resigned yeah. i resigned from bohemians and i came back and i kind of thought i just want to play football again i've i've mm. made lots of mistakes i'm quite comfortable carrying them yeah but i just want to play mm. and i ended up signing my wife was pregnant mm. so i signed short-term contract at Blackpool mm -hmm. which is when they were League One yeah. and went up to the Championship yeah. it was a really really strong squad they'd had a lot of investment into the squad mm -hmm. then I got offered a contract in Cork mm -hmm. which was with a manager who I had huge respect for I'd known him since I was a kid he was Gillingham manager I'd gone on trial to Gillingham when he was there in Kent and I signed for him but mm -hmm. again you talk about football as a giggle we signed in February with a view to the season starting in March and then we went to play in, I think it was the Satanta Cup, it was a competition, an mm. All-Ireland competition, myself and Colin Healy. Yeah. And we travelled up to the north of Ireland to play in this game and we got there, we were told, oh, you can't play tonight, there's some, there's some issue, but everything should be okay. And then we ended up falling under the FIFA 3 club rule. Oh, yeah. So we weren't allowed to play from March till 1st of July. Yeah. 
So, so that to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it became it became where you were thinking. So as a player, you were thinking, oh my God, what if they try and cancel my contract, frustrate my contract? I've mm. committed to two years here. What's going to happen? Then you take legal advice and it was like, they can't do that. And then you can play. But from a football point of view, Cork was probably one of the best times I ever had. Really? Yeah. It was, the dressing room was incredible. Yeah. The city was incredible. Yeah. Being a Dublin lad, sometimes Dublin Cork, there's a rivalry. They were fabulous with me. Yeah. And I loved it. Yeah. And so, you know, if you think about all of the clubs I was at and the career I'd had, mm. I loved Cork. I loved the lads. Did you ever went back to what you play football for in the first yeah, place, which just, is enjoyment? Just, yeah, 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 yeah. And that and that was and that was kind of a big thing. But then, like you say, we we move on again. We go on a chapter again, which was we got back playing, had a very very strong finish to the season, won, won the, the FAI yeah. Cup, and then manager was removed because one of the early funds a fund called Arcega came into Cork and they were going to do this, that, and the other. None of which they actually did. Got rid of the manager, brought a new manager in. I had no relationship with him, and then as you moved into the next year, that's when I when I got when I got sick. Moving on to that, then your illness. I mean, that's a the next chapter of a a challenging time for Gareth Farrelly. I mean, yeah. I, so go on, what talk us for anyone who? I mean, you know, anyone who doesn't know. If no, well, you, if you're okay. Wiki, talking wiki, about yeah, yeah, it. I'm, I'm coming. Wikipedia yeah. is hilarious because you always get different. Uh, interpretations of yeah. what supposedly happened but I want to hear it from you no it was my daughter's birthday it was her fourth birthday 30th okay. of April so we we had a cake blew the candles out I was, I was at Cork at the time mm. but mm. I was injured I was going to see a physio in Bournemouth okay. to help with my knee so I had a pitta for my lunch so you know when you do the amateur doctor stuff yeah kissed him goodbye mm. son was two headed for Bournemouth and then was just travelling as everybody does. But when I got to Warwick, I started to feel sick in the car. Okay. So this is my point. You do an amateur doctor because you think oh, healthy pitta mixed with birthday cake. <laughs> Maybe yeah, that's not yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe that's it. Yeah. But, but the feeling didn't pass. Yeah. So I ended up had to pull over to the hard shoulder, got out of the car and just started vomiting, vomiting blood. So thinking this is you know this is not like this you know you get a bang on the that. nose blood. Mm. This is yeah there must be something here. Felt like I was going to pass out. So sat down at the front of the car, just thinking, right, what am I going to do? Yeah. Got back into the car, phoned for an ambulance. And that's yeah. where, when you get an opportunity to do things like this, the NHS for me is just incredible. I'm only I'm only here because of them. And it's the best thing we've got. Yeah, yeah. And to see the kind of the madness of the world we're living in at the mm. moment, I can never look beyond the care, mm. you know, the love I receive from them. Yeah. So... An ambulance came with the police because obviously the call I had made, you know, someone dizzy, being sick, whatever. Yeah. And they said, you don't look, you don't look too good, dear. Yeah. So I was put on a drip. The police were incredible because yeah. they said, if your car is left here, it will have to go to a pound. I'm happy to drive it to the hospital for you, A&E in Warwick. Yeah. I got taken in. I was passing blood for the, the kind of the rest of that day. A gastroenterologist was on call once a month. Uh, Jeremy Sherman mm. was an incredible man. Yeah. They asked me what I did. I, as everyone would do, I kind of, you know, reluctantly said I play play football. Mm. They went away. Obviously, Google came back, had a bit of a banter about football, him being a Man City fan. <laughs> I was on observations, you know, for the kind of a few hours. Mm. And then I had an endoscopy and he said, there's something in your stomach. We're, you know, we're having mm. a look at it. Yeah. Came back to me within half an hour and said, we think you're going to have to have it taken out. There's a friend of ours who's a fabulous surgeon in Walsgrave Hospital in Coventry. Okay. I'm going to transfer you to him. Finn Odd Menon, an incredible man. I think yeah. he's the head of emergency medicine, like the head of surgery at yeah. Walsgrave now. And I had an ambulance transfer to there. I had a quick CT scan, you know, something in your stomach, same type of thing again, and then came back with another specialist and said, we've had a look again, we need to operate now. So that was it. So what, what was it then? What was it? It was an aneurysm. Oh, so I had yeah. an aneurysm of the splenic artery. So we, we, we go back to Gallo's humour. I had a four-hour surgery. It's like a bad game of operation. I lost 20% of my stomach, 40% of my pancreas, part of my colon and all of my spleen. Because when my aneurysm happened, so yeah. we talk about, you know, people will talk about, you know, brain, aorta, yeah. aneurysms. But yeah. 
the aneurysm had ruptured, which is obviously when I was vomiting the past the blood. blood. But my my organs, it there was a bubble in it, like bad garden hose analogy, and my organs had kind of acted like a tourniquet, okay. which gave them time to find it. Yeah, and then they were able to repair it. So I woke up after surgery, obviously not feeling the best. You know, yeah, yeah, a sense of you know relief or mm -hmm. I'm incredibly lucky. So I had three days in intensive care. My temperature wouldn't regulate. I had blood transfusions. You know, the insurance policy at Cork hadn't been activated. So I had no insurance. So I was to be moved out of the hospital. But then they made a place for me back in the high dependency ward where they looked after me incredibly well. I had three weeks in hospital before I was able to come home. And then I had, like, in theory, a nine-month nine -month recovery. So... I mean, that must have been. Well, I, lo I, I, I lost twenty. Scared, I lost twenty one. Yeah, yeah, incredible. But like, at the again, at the time, you, you don't, you don't, you don't feel that to some degree. Mm. So I, I think I had six to eight weeks at home before I had to go back to the, um, see the surgeon. You know, for for kind of a checkup, and I had lots of side effects. You know, I was on you know morphine, codeine. I had reactions to morphine. I thought I was living and partaking in Harry Potter in real time, <laughs> wow. hallucinations and yeah. different things and withdrawals and infections and a whole host of issues. But every time I would go to the doctor or, you know, have to go and see someone, mm. they'd turn around and they'd say to me, they'd, they'd, they'd bring your file up and they'd go like, oh my God, you're lucky to be here, aren't you? And you'd be kind of thinking, well, I'm not really feeling no, lucky, that at yeah. the minute. You know what I mean? And in mm. some ways it became, it became a challenge because you're thinking, lucky, you know, yeah. this is, this isn't, Better than the alternative, though. Better than the alternative. But mm. when I went back to see the surgeon for the checkup, I kind of said to him, I'd said, listen, just being honest, I said, people are saying, you know, I'm really lucky. Like, what's the... And he said, well, he said, there's two things, Gary. He said, we had somebody in a couple of weeks ago, it was 32, who had a similar thing to you and he, d he didn't make it. Jeez. And he said that from your type of aneurysm, you're probably talking about 10% survival. So that kind so, of... Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, that okay. put things in yeah, focus. Yeah, yeah, for start, you. start to get that now. Mm. But... I just wanted to play. So like similar similar to Cork. Mm. Cork went into administration and tried to get rid of me because it was like, well, you can't play. There's no value. And so they yeah. stopped paying me and they, they just, you know, were incredibly dismissive. An administrator came in and just refused, refused to pay me. This was whilst you're trying to recover from this. So I, want, I, just, wanted, I just wanted to play. So I, I wanted to do rehab. I'd lost 21 pound it was more muscle on a pencil you know you like stuff you were like starting to walk get out of bed again yeah but um i had the tax authorities call to the house whilst i was getting better for a debt that i knew nothing about so they i think at the time the debt was like forty eight thousand pounds so wife's incredibly upset because again the people that had been coming to the house were invariably district nurses doctors yeah. or family and friends yeah and now they had revenue there so i did what we all do i rang my advisor basically said what's going on mm. no nothing about it don't worry it's a mistake it'll all be sorted so that is fundamentally what piqued my interest in in the law so i started to do my rehab at preston okay. but in between that i requested my investment file from like 15 years i went and took it massive box started to work through it when i got home Mm. and started to realise that nothing was as it had been presented to me for a period of years. So I went to see a lawyer and I thought, listen, I think I've got some issues with this, this and this. Mm. And they were like, you know, spoke to me in a very kind of dismissive tone. Okay. But having been in one world all your life where you think you're quite, you know, worldly and understand that, mm. you nod your head in acquiescence because you kind of think, you know, they use terms and they use the language that I didn't understand. Yeah. But I didn't have the confidence to say, I don't understand that. Can you explain it to me? Yeah, so you feign, yeah. you feign knowledge. Yeah. So I decided that if I really want to understand all of these things, I'm going to have to understand the law. And that then kind of opened up that route for me. Mm. I went to a university in Liverpool and I met a woman and I kind of, again, having been comfortable in a footballing environment. And again, people will speak to you all the time, you know, yeah. 50, 60,000 people play in front of them and mm. they'll never bat an eyelid. Whereas if you ask them to do an interview or if you say to them, I want you to do a presentation for me, the wheels will fall off because yeah. it's the most difficult thing in the world. But she was like, you've been out of education for 16 years. You've got, got no chance. Maybe go away, go away and do a foundation course for a couple of years and then maybe come back and see if it would be possible. 
So like I came home and I was like, oh my God, I've just been, I've just got battered today. Not like football banter again. Yeah. You know, we kind of thought, I've just got battered. I can't, I can't possibly contemplate this. And then there was an open day in Edge Hill in Ormskirk. Mm. And my wife said to me, she went, are you going up to the open day today? And I was like, well, I'm not sure. After what happened in Liverpool, I don't, I don't know. And I went up to it anyway. Mm. And again, it was just the polar opposite. The people at the law desk were incredible. And they were like, yeah, mature students. Like, you'll have to have a meeting with the head of the department. Mm. who's become a friend, right? And I went to see him and he was like, you're going to study, you want to study law? And I was like, well, yeah, yeah, I, I think, I think I'd really like it. Mm. I've got, you know, poor, six years, six, seven years is going to take you. And I was like, yeah, no, I know that. You know, well, okay. He said, we do a fast track program in the summer, which is a six week university access program, mm. which is developing academic skills of which some would argue I still have none <laughs> <laughs> and an introduction to the law. Okay. So I had done my rehab at Preston and as I was fitter than I was when I was playing at my peak, right? I was fitter, exactly. stronger. I just wanted to play the game, but mm. you can imagine someone looking at the medical and thinking, we can't, what if something happens here? I yeah. signed non-contract terms at Morecambe mm. with Sammy McElroy. Mm. Season ended. They invited me back for pre-season. Everyone went on holiday and I started the program at Edge Hill. So the only thing I had had with the head of the department was... I'm not saying I'm high profile, right? But I'm saying, you know, mm. Northwest, you still have some degree of profile. So yeah. I said to him, you know, I've not been in education for a long time. I like to keep it like pretty quiet. Yeah, no problem. Mm. So the first morning of the first day on the fast track program, the tutor was an Evertonian. <laughs> so he's read the register out and in front of everybody in the class, he's going, Garrett Farrelly, Everton, what are you, what are you doing here? So it was like so my, was my, my, my anonym, anonymity was yeah. very, very limited. But yeah. I loved, I loved the course, mm. you know, I passed it. I got offered a place on the LLB degree. I went straight back into Morecambe after course was finished for pre-season. Mm. I was loving my football, but life had kind of was shifting because yeah. I recognized I wasn't going to play in the Premier League or the championship again. Mm. And I thought it's time to look at, look at, look at something different. So Sammy McElroy was in the squad or I could have traveled in different things and I got the letter to say university started, say, was, you know, 26th of September or mm. something. And they were traveling. I think they had Exeter away. And it was like, I went to see him and I just kind of thought, I think he was expecting me to say, you know, I'm better than any of the midfielders yeah. playing at the minute. Why are you not playing me? Yeah. But I just said to him, I said, thanks. I've had, you know, I've had a great time, but I'll be leaving next week. And then that was football. Went, went back to university, did my degree. And like you say, we move on to kind of history. I want to, I want to move on, obviously, to where you are now because it is, it's, it is incredible. But just going through all that, just thinking about your wife at that time because obviously you're, you're saying for you, I'll, I'll play football. and But she must have been, A, terrified, young children, husband unwell, obviously. And then when you hear that, you know, 10% and that, which is just making me, my, I've got goosebumps, when you said that I had goosebumps, thinking, oh my God, it is that, you know, that realisation, like, how, she must be strong, and how, how has she come, how, how did she come yeah, through listen, that? Yeah, she, listen, she, she's incredible, and that, you can make a joke about it, saying long-suffering, it's a bit like being an Evertonian, long-suffering wife, <laughs> yeah, a long-suffering yeah, yeah. Evertonian, but I think you just, you have to, you have to deal with it, I think in some mm. ways, women are stronger than men anyway, and mm. I think you just, you work through it, you're talking now, reflecting on you know positive outcome but yeah, again absolutely. like they say it's just at the time it's incredibly challenging but i think say from her point of view priority mm. becomes children you know they're the yeah. most important thing kids were four and two the most difficult thing to think about is that is that my daughter probably would have remembered me but my son wouldn't have yeah so you kind of think that as time moves on now you kind of recognize that mm. and <clears throat> appreciate it mm. a little bit you're grateful for that because you know that might not have been the journey or might not have been how it how, how it is now and you, mm. you look at trauma or you look at tragedy and i'm incredibly fortunate with regards to that mm. you don't pull the curtains back every morning as you know like you spoke earlier yeah. you go, look at the beautiful rain and the wind look at the trees <laughs> yeah. bent over with the wind you know what i mean but yeah. sometimes it brings you back to kind of a grounded position where you have to think right you know we all face different challenges but mm. I think I've been quite fortunate and that 
that kind of that move then towards that transition piece that yeah. I can be honest with people and say I didn't achieve my potential, but yet I achieved yeah. all of the dreams I had yeah. when I was a boy. Yeah. But yet I don't think that you're solely defined by no. football career. No. So what what stimulates me in now is seeing people develop, educate themselves and be equally successful in kind of second careers, whatever that be. So it's so, it's a different kind of perspective. Yeah. So I mean you've come out of I mean I see I mentioned the TV before, seen Wayne Rooney doing his press conference. I didn't conference. know this. No, he, no, no. A press conference for Birmingham the other day and he mentioned he, he thought about becoming a lawyer but then he got the DC United job and Wayne's been on this and he, he never brought law up so I think next time we speak to him we'll be mentioning you and mentioning that law thing but for you moving away from football when I first you look at your story and you see footballer and everything and huge stuff that's gone on yeah, in your but, life yeah, but just, and then not, you see lawyer yeah but not to interrupt you but like oh. that's why I'm hugely appreciative of getting the opportunity to come and talk to you because like I say we spoke in COVID and we end up sometimes yeah. you have the generic conversation of about course. football and yeah. memory and different things like that but I thought it was a good a good interview it was, it was, it, it's always a good interview but I just yeah but I just yeah. mean you don't get no. you don't get the opportunity no. to go deeper because for no. some people they don't they don't want that which is, which is, which is mm. fine mm. because we're dealing on a, a superficial yeah. level whereas there's a nice opportunity to be yeah. able to speak about it. I made a joke about becoming a lawyer because mm. I was saying it was more cost efficient to yeah. tidy up all the mistakes I made <laughs> whilst I was a footballer. <laughs> so Wayne might have a different perspective uh, on that. Possibly, so yeah. At some point, if I see him, it'll be interesting to say, you know, I heard you're interested in yeah. becoming a lawyer. And I'm sure he would attract a whole new group of students who would potentially be interested in doing that. But mm. what was fascinating for me about the law is that football gives you a standing mm. so being a footballer gives you a standing and gives you a voice yeah. right and gives you an opinion but there's not necessarily a lot that sits behind that mm. so what fascinated me about the law was understanding how to think and mm. learning to think in a different way yeah. and become objective and see different sides of things mm. and then you still have what you had in football which is the adversarial challenge around that right mm. so i've been quite fortunate because i enjoy lots of parts of what I do. You have to have a different feeling around that because whilst you were playing football for 16 years, people were starting in law and have developed huge knowledge, expertise mm. and skill. So you have to recognize what you don't know. Yeah. So you will never be able to bridge the 16, 20 year career they've had mm. as you start in the law. Yeah. So you have to think differently in a footballing context as to of course. have to find a different way to win. Mm. How do I become successful? Yeah. So football, sometimes again, I think it's it's easy. People talk about transferable skills and, you know, the skills you acquire as a footballer. But again, mm. it's, you know, people will say whatever they want to say at a given time. I don't think necessarily people believe it or it's reflective of leadership or executive positions within football, which again is a really interesting area for me around the precarious position that football is in. So mm. you need more people involved in the decision making, be it club federation association that have had that experience. But mm. equally, you need to be educated, you know, empowered in those environments to be able to to be able to operate. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite fortunate. So Wayne Rooney becoming a lawyer is like, you know, is, is a massive thing. But mm. will he ever do it? You know, you'll have to ask him the next time you have him in. Mm -hmm. But I think like for me, my route has been different because everybody who I spoke to at the time and even now to a degree was, oh, God's perfect time and you're going to be a sports lawyer. And I was like, well, no, because I want to be a commercial litigator Okay. because I want to understand what happened to me when I played. I want to understand what my agents did. I want to understand what the financial advisors did. I want to understand the investments I was put into. Mm -hmm. I need to develop an understanding of that. Yeah. And that's what I was able to do. So I trained at a really, really good firm in London. Mm -hmm. And that was my motivation. So you can't outrun your past. So then invariably, you end up doing more and more sports law. Of course, but yeah. I'm learning every day. This is mm -hmm. the thing about football that fascinates me is that you used to go home worrying about, you know, someone said something to me today or different things. Whereas yeah. I have a to-do list that I go home every day and think I had nine things to do today and I did one of them. So I need to do the next eight tomorrow. Yeah. M my, my life has shifted. Yeah. So I go back to you and say football has had huge highs, mm. but I don't live for them. Yeah. And I don't see them as defining me. Mm. I can be open with you 
comfortable here yeah. to have an open conversation that I wouldn't have with others. Mm. But the point is that that part of my life yeah. is, 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 is gone. Yeah. I still love the game, but I think it's a bigger mm. challenge for those that their identity is so heavily associated with what they did once. Mm. And football is ruthless in that way because yeah. you can be footballer on a Sunday, score the winner, walk into a lounge, everybody will flock to you. You can retire on a Monday and there'll be some younger one there that everybody will flock to and you'll be stood there thinking, yeah. well, hang on a sec, that was me the other day. It is. Ruthless. And, that, and, and yeah. it doesn't discriminate. No. You can have a huge amount of money in the bank or not. Mm. You'll still face those same challenges. So I think there's still this story to be told around that and the reality to it, but it's not It's not attractive. It doesn't attract the disco no. lights or the fairy dust. But yet everybody who has the fortune to be able to be a professional faces them challenges in a different way. I think it's incredible. It, it's so insightful but and so weird, I think, with, with the with football, as I remember seeing, I can't remember what player it was on Goodison Road. They'd been playing the year before, <clears throat> so I'm thinking last year you'd <laughs> yeah, have been walking yeah. up the road, yeah, yeah. everyone'd have been around you, and they were walking into one of the lounges, and a couple of people were like, "Oh, there's <laughs> such and such," just like a foot or whatever, and it's like last year wouldn't have, would have been mobbed, and that that is the psychology of like, yeah, you played for us last season, but now nah, you just you yeah, just yeah, got yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah, 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 and it's that, it's, it's tough for people. Yeah. It's tough that, for people and, because yeah. again, like. Sorry, just in, in talking today, like yeah. 40% of professional footballers face the threat of bankruptcy within five years of retiring. A third of footballers are divorced within the first year of retirement. And you mentioned it earlier, we can talk about 30, 35% of players that are presented with like different mental health issues. Mm. And you know what I mean? It's not the part of the story that people will people, ever be attracted no. to, but you, you, you see it you see it more and more now. It's and it's, it, it comes back to like, when we have a meeting, like mm. you see people, you might meet people expert, and you'll see how they're carrying that tension or how they're struggling mm. with that. And we can make a joke about it because, you know, you mentioned wives, but it's, it's, diff it's different mm. because you're dealing with a lack of purpose, identity. Yeah. And then you have a situation where it's probably a similar version of a different story for your wife. And you get yeah. a situation where yeah. you end up having conversations where she may say, do you know what? I preferred it when you weren't here. We yeah. were, you know, and and, yeah, and, and it yeah. brings different challenges and mm. everybody has to work through that in their own way. And it's, it, it, it can be, it can be difficult. And as I say, for me, in making that transition probably a little bit earlier and having to think about it in a different way, it gave me a, a, a different perspective on that. Mm. But it's, it's indiscriminate. You can travel around Europe, you can travel globally and ex-footballers, that they will all face that challenge. Mm. I'm not lobbying here to try and create no, no. sympathy, you know, or, but I'm just saying there's, 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 there's something slightly different around that, that mm. nobody really likes when the, when the, when the lights fade. Yeah. It's a different challenge. So mm. like you say, for me, you can go back to your grounds, your former clubs, but I'm not, you know, I'm not defined by that. Mm. I, I enjoy sitting, having a chat with you. Like I enjoy the, even, even, say going back to grounds is meeting people friends people yeah, that you yeah, liked yeah. i don't i don't i don't have to do that every week now mm. but you know what i mean no but that, that, i think that's what's fascinating about your story because it is it is too easy to just pitch yeah. no footballers though the footballer yeah. ex-footballer sit on sky and and tell yeah. everyone else how to play the game yeah, yeah it, but you've for, got a different yeah totally yeah, different yeah career. completely so but for some that's their journey and, and that's oh, and that's and, yeah. and that's fine but again i i just i just think it's interesting because mm. there's so much there is so much more it's not easy because no. like you say mm. we all we all face ongoing challenges but the point is that there's there's a lot more there's a lot more out there i mean it, it qualified as a solicitor in 2018 joining the litigation and sports law team became a senior associate Associate of Behrman's in 2021. Um, what kind of stuff do you do? I know there's a lot of... I want to ask you about VAR in a minute because I know No, 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 great. No, no. So from the, but, the legal part, yeah. so I've, I've, uh, um, I, had, I had five super years at Behrman's, mm -hmm. some really, really good people. Yeah. And like football transfers, we move across. I've, I've moved to a new firm three months ago. Yeah. Glazers, yeah, who've Glazers opened an office that, yeah. in, um, in, in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. So... They're building their team in Liverpool, which is really, really exciting. Yeah. You know, they've, they've just moved into a new office in Manchester. So day to day, it's quite fascinating. So commercial disputes, commercial litigation are some of the issues. So okay. in bringing it back to, you know, the start of the legal journey, yeah. I, I deal with a lot of cases, say, around people that may have issues with their agents, okay. people who've been ripped off. Yeah. Um, sports people. Sports yeah. people, right, and high net worth individuals. So okay. a lot of my work yeah. is around that. Then... 
dealing with the financial advisors. So again, looking at potential claims against financial advisors in relation to products that they may have been sold at different times. Right. So it sounds bad. Mm. I'm not saying that I've got areas of specialism, but I deal with a lot of tax avoidance schemes. Yeah. Okay. So as a product and as a kind of generation, our group of footballers were sold film tax partnerships, which again is okay. a boring conversation for a different day. But the point mm. is they were never sold as tax avoidance. Yeah. You know, they were sold as products. They were sold as individuals benefiting the British film industry and okay. they're incredibly complex and over a period of time these schemes unraveled mm. and people have been left with catastrophic liabilities over the over the mis-selling of these products. So then from a legal point of view you're looking back and going right who's who's accountable for this who's responsible where yeah. does liability sit is there the possibility to seek compensation recompense restitution in relation to these things and that's kind of a lot of the work I do. And obviously what exists around that is HMRC demands for that tax benefit that wasn't really a benefit that was, yeah. you know, paid mm. to individuals. Yeah. So I deal with a huge amount of that. So again, that work has evolved over kind of the last 10, 12 years, but we talk about the book, the life, the fairy tale. Whilst I was training, mm. we built and developed a class action suing a host of different parties okay. around those schemes that were sold and that and that that legal case was settled in May 2022 but there's still a lot of issues around that seven years the case was running for whilst people were still having to deal with the carnage of you know demands yeah understanding their true position because again you're 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 insulated. You live in a world where you're totally mm. protected. You, course, you don't yeah. really have an understanding. You're, you're, you're trusting of the people you have around you, some of whom will be good people, but some of whom necessarily are not. So mm. every year or t biannually, they'd sit with you and tell you, listen, everything's great. Here's where you're at. Everything's doing really, really well. But then when you get to a point of actual, you know, inspection or critical analysis, yeah. you start to realise that the picture that, that had been case. painted for you is not the case. So when it unravels, who do you go to? Mm. Who who can help you with this? You. How do you bridge? Yeah, but yeah. in some ways, but mm. how do you bridge? How do you bridge that? Yeah. You know, lack of understanding or the language or yeah. where do I go with it? So so yeah, so that's so that's kind of a lot of my work, and then increasingly more and more kind of sports regulatory and kind of disciplinary work and governance and things like that. So all all exciting stuff. Oh, but really. what's interesting is that still as a lawyer, there's days where you're sat there and thinking, you know. I was playing football. How am I doing <laughs> yeah. this? Yeah, I've read a document eight times and not taken a word in. Yeah, so I sit on the ind I sit on the FA judicial panel. Okay. So I'm an independent football panel member. Right. So you might get a call to sit across a range of cases, be it betting, anti-doping, oh, okay. um, safeguarding. Yeah, you know, agents, regulations, breaches, and hear cases. So that's kind of nice because again, you're getting your football fix. Yeah, if you like and you have the stimulation of being involved in cases like that, which is really interesting. So mm. I've, I've got quite a diverse kind of practice Absolutely. around that. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very lucky. Cause obviously we've got, I don't, don't expect it to comments on them cause you can't, but obviously we've seen like, I think Tony, we've got all this stuff going on. So it does happen. And, and there is a lot of stuff around betting and I've seen, um, it was Roy Hodgson yesterday, I think speaking about it and, and how football needs to, to look at that yeah. that relationship with Betting. But that is so diverse what you're doing. I've also seen player for player involved in player for player. Yeah, yeah. So, like, so, so what what is player for player? So, so one of the things you talk about lifelong learning, right? Or mm -hmm. we talk about education and stimulation, right? So yeah. so again, uh, maybe it's one of the transferable skills from football is that I did my degree and I thought, well, I've a, you know, I've got a degree now. Yeah. What's next? Mm -hmm. Well like masters okay, I'd like to do a master's and then you explore <clears throat> what different kind of master's programs are out there. Okay. And UEFA run a master's program for former internationals. Okay. So it's called the uh, Executive Masters for International Players. So I started researching that and it was like a 20-month program, seven different European footballing venues finishing in the US. You have to prepare a dissertation on a subject of your choice. And... I did the interview for the course and again, Baz, being honest with you, I thought I'm not high profile enough to get on this program. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's far bigger and better players than me on mm -hmm. a European level. But the unique part I had was obviously the fact that I'd returned to education, yeah. you know, so I was kind of, I, I understood 
you know, the demands you got the niche. part mm -hmm. of the course. Yeah, yeah, like with that. One of the points was you had to like prepare what you think your next career would look like, okay. which I was kind of ahead of the game. Yeah. Then a secondment and then a managerial report on a subject mm. of your choice. So I got on the course and the thing with the course that was amazing was, you know, people you may have competed against for years and years mm. and like you're you're retiring. Yeah. So everybody's kind of in a new position. And there was like, there was a really, really incredible atmosphere amongst the people who were doing the course, but also an honesty mm. around the kind of challenges they faced. Yeah. So the programme was incredible. I can't, you know, speak highly enough of it. Mm. There's now like an alumni of over 102, four cohorts. The fifth cohort started in uh, Switzerland last week. We were there for the graduation of the fourth cohort and General Assembly and to speak to them. And the program's, program's incredible. So it's starting people on their second journey yeah. and learning some of the skills and understanding all of the different things that exist around football that we don't know about, Mar you know, publishing, marketing, yeah. communications, like all, all of the different challenges, leadership, you know, strategy. It was, it, it, it was excellent. So mm. within that group, then there was a group of us that kind of thought, well, like what was not out there to help us. Yeah. So the unions do an incredible job. You know, it's not again, confrontational or conflictual towards anybody else, mm. but it would be nice to be able to have something that offers soft, you know, soft guidance towards what someone might want to do. Yeah. So a transition. So player for player was born out of yeah. that. So Stylian Petrov is the main driver of that now on a yeah. day to day basis with Doug Reed. Michael Johnson was involved, Emil Heskey, mm -hmm. uh, Gaska Mendieta. And I think I think I think it's a good thing. But mm -hmm. again, it's a challenge because some of the skills that make you successful in football, right? are equally destructive so okay. everybody everybody arrives at their own stage of awakening at a different mm. a different time so you don't have to have the answer straight away so like yeah. you say some people will try you know punditry to mm. see if that's for them as a career second mm. career some you know will do it for a short time are you prepared to invest in yourself to become really really good at it mm. are, you know everything that exists around that some will have different ventures entrepreneurial they might want to be agents. They might want to step out of football altogether. So mm. there's a really, really broad variation. There's others want to be sporting directors. But again, football and the executive side are two different sides of the game. So mm. it's more, you know, demonstrating that there's opportunity. But in order to grasp those opportunities, your former profile might get you in the room. Yeah. But then you have to be able to back it up, don't you? And that's and, and again, that's that's the different challenge that moving beyond just opinion, because I think so, to having an informed educated opinion about how you think something should be absolutely i mean it sounds i mean you've done so much you've referees panel as well i think is it or independent no we have a, we have a great well, well, it's a great chat because the thing with football is that you, you look at like some does it does it does a an incredible laziness around football mm. so so one of the roles in the last few years i had was being a premier league delegate which was kind yeah. of assessing and you know observing the referees yeah and it was incredible experience because mm. you get to see up close how they work and you can't but have an incredible respect for for them. Mm -hmm. Like they operate in a world where despite everything we've spoken about today so far, which hopefully people will mostly forget. <laughs> but the point is they operate in a world where if they get if they get it right, they're wrong. And if they get it wrong, they're wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's quite it's quite a unique world. Yeah. So to see that up close gave me a completely different perspective for them and a mm -hmm. you know, an increased respect for the for the job they have, the level of scrutiny they're mm. under at any given time and like we were talking so VAR is fine like I'm yeah. happy to have the conversation but I think mm. what's always fascinating with VAR is the same people that moaned about the previous system and wanted VAR brought in are now the same people moaning about VAR mm. and this comes back to that decision making process yeah. again and how careful you have to be to protect the game because mm. there's a real real danger around the game that capital will trump all and that we, we won't have the game we love anymore yeah. so I took part in VAR training. I've seen it all up close. My average decision making time was about 23 minutes. I think we based on the interview, people would be turning the lights off and saying, yeah, 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 Garrett, can you turn the lights off on your way out? And I'd be like, I just need to see it once more. Baz, just show me once more. So yeah. it's a human element to all of these things that sometimes gets lost. So yeah. I agree, huge errors, mistakes, mm. human error. But I think fundamentally, it's very, very easy for people to sit back three days later having read everything seen what people have said mm. understanding where the media have positioned themselves and then they're all 
absolutely categoric in their position on how these things work. Yeah. I don't think it's easy. We've seen it at the weekend, you know, mm. the derby, mm. different things that it will never not be talking points, but course, you have yeah. to protect the game. You have mm. to protect the game and the people in it. Fair. It's an interesting, I think, I think I'll get you back in and we'll, we'll have a more in-depth chat on that because I think that interest in yeah, what but you we, saying, it, but. but there's a huge human psychology element mm. to this as well because it's like I, I joke about making a decision but the point is we, we were joking about it before but mm. if you see an incident right and then goes back are you happy with your decision boss? Mm. and you go right, yeah, yeah yeah I'm happy with yeah. my decision do you want to see it once more and then you go see the doubt yeah why do I need to see it once more <laughs> if I'm comfortable in my decision do you think I need to see it once more well go on Baz I think just maybe have one look at it to make sure you're comfortable mm. comfortable I was comfortable straight away. <laughs> yeah, but let me see it. Yeah. And then you watch it again and you think, yeah. well, hang on a sec. I still think I'm right, but why has he asked me? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm comfortable. But then someone says, there's been another incident just happened, Baz. Can you have a look at that? It's a penalty appeal. It's not It's not an easy, yeah. it's not easy. And I, I think we can talk about it, but yes. it can be better. I mm. think people talk about cricket and people talk about rugby union, rugby league, but... The game is completely different. Mm. It's like the comms, listening to what they have to say. I think you have to have a clear strategy about how you believe it should work mm. and not be reactive to the world that exists around it, which is a challenge for everybody in in sport. Mm. Incredible. Well, at the end of this podcast, I always ask people five things they can't do without. Oh God, five! five. I You've got a name. Well, five. What, what, are the, what are the normal? What are the normal? Well, I'm, I'm, no, but I'd be leading the witness as a lawyer there. Criminal so. lawyer, though. I'm not. I'm not a criminal lawyer. <laughs> no, five God, things no. You li- like that you listen, can, you don't think you can. Well, do your that. family. Mm. I think that's 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 the most important thing. Absolutely. Your, your, your friends, the mm. people you have around you. That's two. Is that two? That's two. What are, What are some of the normal answers from people? People will choose food. People oh, choose. No, food. Michael Ball went for a, fo- a football. I, d- I don't believe him, but I think he just wanted to throw that in. Could be anything. You didn't ask him to qualify that. No, no, because yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. quick fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think. Listen, after everything we spoke about today, I, I, I think your, your, your family's the most mm. important thing. Mm. Family, friends, the people you have around you. Yeah. As I say, not. And I'm not trying to fudge it, but five. I would have been prepared in advance as to five of the things, but I, I think beyond that. Yeah, they're the most important. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think, like you say, I got... You could have gone wife, me kids, me best mate. Yeah, but I, it's the same. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, 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 so try and cover cover that in one. Yeah, yeah. Fair but enough. they would be the most, yeah. they're the most important things for anybody. I yeah. think I think we're living in a really, really strange time at the moment. Like mm. if anybody stands up and talks about the important things being yeah, respect, love, compassion, you know what I mean? Yeah. But you look that's... at the people that still inspire you and I think mm. they would still hold those values really, really closely. Mm. I think if you look globally at the moment, the world we're living in is quite a strange place. We're talking about yeah. an abject lack of leadership. I mm. think we're in Everywhere, yeah. a very, very challenging time. And mm. I think even on this level, getting an opportunity to speak to you, which I've which I've loved, you know, mm. that is that an opportunity to show that there's a slightly different way to the madness and mayhem and mania mm. that we're kind of working through at the moment. Absolutely. Final question then. It's not five. It's not no, five things. No, it's no five things. It's no five things. What What's next for Gareth Farrelly then? This this part of you, you know, you've had a football career. You've had challenges on the way, and you've made a successful transition into a new career, which I think is fantastic. Totally different, but still, you've still got that involved. So, what 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 do you want to achieve still? Have you got anything, or is it literally just see what happens? Is, is there another Is there another goal for I think Gareth? It's fascinating because again, the one question that always stumped me. So you move, like you say, you move from a football world into a commercial world, and there's a lot mm. of interviews and different things you would have done at different times, mm. and people would say that to you, like, "Where do you Where do you see yourself in five mm. years?" And again, not in a slapstick kind of way, you'd mm. always turn around and say, like, given my life experience, I like to be alive. Yeah. That's kind of my first, your first point, Absolutely, right? Absolutely. Yeah. But I still enjoy stimulation and working with good people, mm. you know, and projects. So yeah, like you mentioned, player for player is one project, mm. but I'm also involved in a project which is a club representative body. It's okay. the Union of European Clubs, mm. which I developed three years ago with a friend of mine in Croatia, okay. which is... Uh, looking to represent the interests of small and medium-sized clubs, right, who don't necessarily feel they have a voice amongst the football stakeholder system at the moment. So that's been a fascinating project over the last kind of three years. Mm. 
dealing with the Super League, dealing with how you try and develop an organisation, dealing with all of the stakeholders. So dealing with like FIFA, UEFA, uh, European leagues, FIFA Pro, Fan Supporters Europe, mm. you know, the ECA, managing all of that, the conflicts. Yeah. And that project launched in Brussels in April, right? So now we're kind of in the membership build phase of this okay. and encountered politics on a level I've never experienced it for before. So we've been dealing with the European institutions, European Commission, European Parliament, and that's kind of a fascinating project on its own. And understanding the football ecosystem on a level that as a player I would have never had any exposure to. Yeah. How do decisions get made? So fundamentally we talk about the challenges, you know, Everton is our club, we talk mm. about the challenges, but understanding decision making in the in the European and global game. Yeah. Right, so maybe different conversation for a different day, but yeah. understanding how all of that works. So who yeah. makes the decisions? Yeah. So we talk about revenue, we talk about the constant pursuit of more, but the point is, what's the important thing about your club? Identity, values, yeah. community, yeah. health, education, the different things that exist around that and the potential for good that on too many occasions can be hijacked for commercial purposes, yeah, yeah. right? So that's that's been a fascinating project. and. Mm operational day to day so having to deal with different challenges around that because change is not easy no. so people are reluctant to it and mm. also being a perceived threat within that football ecosystem oh, yeah. so having to deal with European Club Association who is the rec recognised representative body for clubs in Europe mm. but new organisations are always born from a perceived lack and mm. if people don't feel that they have that representation so that's been a really really interesting project and I'm involved in that now so I enjoy that. Yeah, I think stimulation is what you crave because it's back to purpose that if you don't have that, life becomes more difficult. So mm. you might not be a footballer anymore, but like you still need that purpose on a daily basis, that transition again. You may have this illusion like lots of people do that, well, when I retire, I'm going to play golf. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't think that endures you know, there's yeah. a bigger, there's a bigger piece around, Absolutely. around purpose. So mm. I enjoy that. So what comes next? You know, I'm fortunate that even as a lawyer, I'm still learning. You know, mm. I, I'm not a finished article in any way yeah. with regards to that. But stimulation, I think, keeps you young, mm. keeps you relevant. And then that purpose is kind of important in it. So football is, it's in it's in my blood. Mm. You know what I mean? I've, yeah. I, I've never not been involved in it mm. on varying levels. So there may be opportunities at a different time. But for now, yeah. you know, I don't tend to go too far ahead, but yeah. I enjoy I enjoy the challenge around that. I enjoy building things and being around a value based system and you know, but understanding how all of these things work and how difficult it can be. And I think that's probably been, you know, we talk about the education piece, you know, doing a masters and then from the masters you move on to your next thing, which is like I'm involved in a fellowship with Harvard, which is also a program that Harvard have developed for ex athletes. Okay. And again, that's that learning that exactly. stimulation because you're getting access to people that you know have operated and operate at a, a high, high high level mm -hmm. and that 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 helps you improve as well so that that's like that's fascinating for me because that learning is is a driver you know people never yeah. lose that drive when you stop you know being an athlete but it kind of uh, presents itself in different kind of forums of course yeah is that final, does that answer that question yeah, or is great, that an answer? No, no, it's a great, it's a great answer. This is my final one. What is, the, what is the one question I should have asked you? One question you should have asked me? No, to it, to I, be I, honest I, with you, as, as a host, I've, listen, you know, we spoke before, I've always got massive respect for what, what, what you guys do here anyway, but no, 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 I think the thing about the interview sometimes is sometimes you'll get someone who will contact you beforehand and say, I can't discuss this, I can't discuss that, I can't, you know what I mean? As a lawyer, there's certain things that I can't go into detail of mm. that I would have strong opinions on. But mm. I think I you have to be open and honest with people because hopefully someone might listen, look, watch, whatever, and mm. see something different to what their perception may have been before. And that's mm. the thing for me is that, you know, changing perception, but also providing a different kind of insight and story to the lazy, stereotypical one of... Uh, 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 I don't, people have a lot more to offer and mm. you just have to bring it out in them, so... I would rate you very highly for the interview, not <laughs> questions that weren't asked. Thank you very much. Gareth, listen, it's it's been a pleasure today. Um, thanks for being so open. Obviously, no. the story is unique in terms of, again, I think it's... I have Michael Branson here 
a while ago and he was telling me about the difficulties of the mental side of like cope and he'd, he'd do well for 70 minutes then think take me off before I miscontrol a pass and when you see that side of footballers I think it's it reminds us that footballers are human beings we, we think the computer like I've said this before yeah. we think the computer games this perfect footballer turns up plays 10 out of 10 and if he doesn't we can say what we want about and we forget that the human beings but Thank you for coming in and being so open, talking about difficult things that have gone on. And it, it is, it's still, it's strange and it shouldn't be, but to see a footballer taking a totally different route, I think it's fantastic, by the way. And yeah. I think it's a. But there's lots who do. Know, there's lots of, mm. there's lots who do. And but them it, stories aren't sexy, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But like you say, that there are, there are stories that exist at a level of people that are doing like incredible stuff. And I'm not going back to that MIP program as an example, but I'm saying even, you know, Sometimes those stories need to be, you know, presented. Absolutely. And, and, and as, you know, okay, this sits with the person to be able to do it as well. And of they course. may not want to do that. But like, it was like the law. People turned around to me and said, oh, well, like, you're one of Stuart Ripley as a lawyer, uh, an incredibly capable <sighs> lawyer. Banger. He was, yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah, but a Premier League winner. Mm -hmm. So when yeah. he when he retired, that was the route he took. So he's, you know, yeah. incredibly accomplished and a role mm. model with regards to that he also you know his son is a is a goalkeeper he's also done some agency work on the back of you know representing him mm. Udo Anweri is a private client lawyer in London who had a different career path played at Blackpool mm. was at Fulham as a young player you know there's some players now who are studying law I'm not saying that we need to get the Wayne Rooney story <laughs> out there but there's there's, but, there's yeah. people that are thinking about that mm. kind of second career different people that have moved into different sectors there'll always be a, an allure or a pull mm. towards football, yeah. which will never move. Mm. But there needs to be a shift with regards to, right, as there's more and more roles become yeah. open to the game, yeah. right? And I, I've, I've had, not the long goodbye, right? But I'm saying there's a friend of mine who's heavily involved in, say, the recruitment of front office and back office staff, say, in US sports. Okay. And that's happening now more and more in football because of the US because investors yeah. buying into football oh, right, but the yeah. point is that i would say you know as we mm. talk buzzwords but like transferable skills and you need more mm. of the right type of ex-players involved in the management and decision making of the game yeah but he would say if you look at the game now capital finance marketing that's where the skill sets are that you would possibly be light in mm. so we have to find a way of bridging the between the two that because of your love of the game that never leaves you. Yeah. Whereas people that are coming from capital don't necessarily have that same course, yeah. feel mm -hmm. for the game, but also for the people that are involved in it. And I think that can only be a good thing. And that's why I would always advocate that. Or when I get an opportunity to speak, say with you or whoever, mm -hmm. that what do we, you, you say the question we didn't ask, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, one of the questions I always ask when I do a lot of these things would be, what do you want the game to look like in five years? Mm-hmm. And I think that's an interesting challenge yeah, for because is, everything yeah. is so short term. Of course. We yeah. very rarely move beyond it. Now, don't mm. get me wrong. You win on Saturday and your week is great. Yeah. You lose, you know, Monday, Tuesday is a bit heavy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But the point is there's a bigger picture here. Yeah. Only on a football level, but it's reflective of, you know, we go we go bigger politically or we look at what's going on globally. Mm. What do we want yeah. the next five years? What do we want football to be like in the next five years? Elite? Mm. Exclusive? Or? Fair and inclusive. I think. Yeah. yeah. So nice fascinating time. Thank you very much. Giving up your time. No pleasure. Massively Thanks. Thank you for thank you for having me in. Absolutely pleasure. Yeah. Great to see you. Thanks, Alan.